Three minutes after ten. I, morning, by the way. I hope you're well. Two days to go. Two days out now. I um. I some days. You, I, I sit upstairs thinking, should we talk about this or not? It, it's so obviously desperate and, and profoundly hypocritical to the point of, of actually being a national embarrassment, the way that the Tories and elements of the client media have tried to inflate this story about Keir Starmer having dinner on Fridays. I, 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 should, we, should we give it attention? Do we inflate it by giving it oxygen? Do, do we actually bring it to the attention of people who may be stupid enough? to think that it is in, in some way damaging to Keir Starmer. And some days I think, no, I probably shouldn't give it any more attention. And other days I sort of think, well, you know, if, if, if people are going around hosing the electorate with liquid manure, then perhaps it's our job to, 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 to go around afterwards hosing them down with, with scented soap water. I, I, I honestly don't know. I, 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 I honestly don't know. I, I, I guess it's subject dependent, isn't it? It's, it's got something to do with context. Imagine if you would for a moment how Tory politicians and client journalists, the kind of Tory journalists who were pro-Boris Johnson, pro-Brexit, pro-Liz Trust, pro-Rishi Sunak, pro-Austerity, pro-David Cameron, pro-Cuts, I, you can probably think of a few off the top of your head. Uh, imagine how they would be behaving today if a left-wing politician or commentator, let us invoke the ghost of Jeremy Corbyn or a Diane Abbott or a Keir Starmer or an Angela Rayner, had attacked a Tory politician for observing Friday night dinner with their Jewish husband or wife. Just imagine for a minute what the headlines and, and what the spittle-flecked commentators would be spewing this morning. If a left-wing politician had attacked a Jewish family or a politician with a Jewish wife for observing the Friday night tradition of, of having a family dinner. Uh, he gave an interview to the rather splendid mother and daughter podcasting team of, of Jesse and Lenny Ware. Um, I think it was last year. I've had the great privilege of going on that podcast myself and I, it is an enormous amount of fun and they have this incredible gift of of getting you to relax. I, I'm, I'm a, not a politician so you don't need to get me to relax but but they managed with, with Keir Starmer to um, lead him into territory where I, I don't think he had necessarily been before and and the Jewish Chronicle picked up on this story last year. Remember, anybody pretending today to think that this is uh, in, uh, damaging to Keir Starmer, you can you can know two things about them. Number one, they display their desperation like a forehead tattoo, and number two, they will be well aware of this story in the Jewish Chronicle in July of last year. They just may. Um, be pretending not to be. But but the phrase he, he used was really nice and really special, the weekly tradition of Friday night dinners. Um, I, I won't do a Friday night event. I choose to spend the evening at home with my family for Shabbat. He's not Jewish himself. Uh, his wife is. And her dad often joins the family for Shabbat. He, he describes it as a rock in the week. I don't know. I I I, I don't know. I, I I mean, Jeff says don't amplify the the the, the right wing press and their inane headlines. But the the headlines are out there. I genuinely don't know whether or not it, it falls to us some mornings to I, I provide some truth with which to balance out exaggerations and lies. But I, I but I would focus first on that simple thought of of how. The kind of people pretending today, Grant Shapps, pretending today that Keir Starmer has some sort of question to answer or that there's some sort of misstep here. How on earth they'd behave if a Jeremy Corbyn fan had attacked uh, a, a right-wing politician for observing a, a, a Jewish family tradition on Friday nights. Just, just focus on that. Just think about that. That's all. Don't think about anything else with regard to this story. Just think about how the people pretending to be cross with Keir Starmer today would be behaving if the boot, as it were, were on the other foot. And, and then you get an indication of just how broken the Tory establishment is, don't you? Client media just doesn't know what to do. Everything they dreamt of for 14 and a half years has happened. They got it all. They got every single thing they wanted. I was looking today, looking back at some of the headlines with which they greeted Liz Truss's budget, I, I greeting it as the finest thing that had ever happened to, uh, uh, to, to the British economy, queuing up to pour 
praise onto a, a woman who often gave the impression of having an IQ in single figures. Nigel Farage, today was the best conservative budget since 1986, he tweeted in September of 2022. They got every single thing they wanted. And look what's happened. This is what is so interesting to me as, as we near the home straight of this election with, of course, nothing guaranteed, nothing certain. But they got every single thing they wanted for 14 and a half years and it's come to this. I think we need to pause to register just how significant this is. Because, you know, I can't remember a period in, in, in UK politics where so many victories were secured by the ruling party. I, I Probably because of my age and, and, and my memory. But these are big things, you know. Austerity was huge. We talked yesterday about youth clubs and the, 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 the soul that has been ripped out of communities by the closure of youth clubs. And, of course, the impact that it has upon things like gang violence and youth crime. The austerity, shutting sure start centres, uh, deciding on ideological grounds that the country's most vulnerable people were in receipt of too much largesse. The rhetoric of, of flat screen TVs somehow becoming government policy. Nonsense rhetoric. Lazy radio phone in staples of the 1990s. Everybody unemployed is swinging the lead. A, a, a becoming government policy. And then they got their Brexit as well. The, the Brexit that they dreamed of without ever actually stopping to wonder what happens if the dog catches the car. You know, what happens? And now we found out. Again, Farage all over. Boris Johnson's Brexit deal, praising it to the rafters the moment it was signed. It, it, extraordinary to think that they told us Liz Truss's budget was brilliant. They told us Rishi Sunak was, was a safe pair of hands, uh, a managerial genius who would come in and bring his financial nous to the entire country and, and, and turn things round at breakneck speed. Fourteen and a half years of getting every single thing they wanted and look where they are today. Look where they are today. I, 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 not just the triviality, the short-term triviality of pretending to be cross that Keir Starmer eats on Fridays with his family, or tries to. Uh, the idea that if something significant was happening, he'd, he'd turn his phone off and lock himself in the loo. It's just too ridiculous even to contemplate, never mind talk about. Um, and, and that's the, the, the little, trivial, momentary illustration of how desperate things are. A much bigger picture um, is probably best summed up in this article today from The Guardian, where the, uh, a, a, it's reported a senior Tory has described Sunak's campaign as the worst in my lifetime. One senior party figure said yesterday it had been the worst campaign in my lifetime, saying that while Sunak was wholly to blame for the early election, there was a feeling that Isaac Levido, his, his advisor, his key strategist, could have pushed back more against the July date and that CCHQ should have taken the fight to reform earlier. There are so many factors to what I think Everyone can agree whether you are intending to vote conservative on Thursday or not. I think everyone can see that this has been an extraordinarily bad campaign. And it's hard to pinpoint precisely why. How, after 14 and a half years of getting absolutely everything they wanted, has a party that has a centuries-old reputation for prioritizing power above everything else, for, for having a ruthless commitment to power, to maintaining, to attaining and maintaining power, arguably the most successful electoral machine in the history of international politics. How has it come to this? How has it been reduced to a shower of charlatans and incompetence pretending to be cross about the man most likely to be Prime Minister on Friday morning, revealing that he likes to have tea with his family on Fridays. I, I, I just want to look at why this has been the worst campaign of our lifetimes. Uh, or was it inevitable? I, 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 I hope you share my curiosity on the question of how much of this was Sunak's fault and how much of this 
was somehow an inheritance. I, I mean, could a massive liar, could a better liar than Rishi Sunak have pulled it off? Could it could a Boris Johnson or a Nigel Farage? Could could a, a snake oil salesman par excellence have somehow pulled this off and and and, and separated themselves from? 14 and a half years of getting everything they wanted while campaigning on how they're the people to repair the awfulness. I, 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 there are days, aren't there, where you, you step back from it and you think to yourself, this is nuts. We are not a normal country anymore. 14 and a half years of getting every single thing they wanted and trying to campaign upon a promise to fix the mess. I think the beginnings of the answer to the question I'm asking perhaps lie there. Why has this campaign been so bad, bad or mad and dangerous to know? But um, I, I, I find, uh, I find the, the, the simple detachment from what used to be normal almost impossible to process. It's not a hard, yeah, it's a good question. Actually. Say, where are you getting the half from? It's 14 years, isn't it? It's, I, think, I think what I like to say is the best part of a decade and a half. The best part of a decade and a half. That's where the half comes from. I've, mis, I've misattributed the half. Forgive me. Um, 10, 15 is the time. 14 years then of getting absolutely everything they wanted. And they've ended up running what is, according to this senior Tory and, and many other supporters, traditional historic supporters of the party, running the worst campaign in living memory. Probably Michael Foote would be your go-to leader, but he wasn't, of course, campaigning as, as prime minister. Um, 10.15 is the time. I, I don't know whether we're going to return in detail to this 6 p.m. on Friday story. I, 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 it's interesting to read the text. I share your disgust at how some elements of the conservative establishment have chosen to treat that story, uh, although I've written a book about how low um, right-wing media and right-wing politicians have been brought by the failure of all the things that they champion. But I don't want to do it first. I, I don't want to do it first. I want first to look at the broader conservative campaign and the question of how or why, actually, why has it all been so awful? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. In in the interest of I don't know if you want to call it balance or something else, I mean, you are welcome to ring me and tell me it hasn't been awful. But I, I I mean the Labour campaign has not been fireworks. They seem to have subscribed to the idea that it's pointless interrupting your enemy while they're soiling themselves, you know, while they're making mistakes. But but let's look at the big picture now. Fourteen years in power, winning every single victory that they strove for certainly since 2015 when david cameron secured that majority and dispensed with the need for coalition government if you, if you want to say right wing pro brexit free market tories whether they are in the media or whether they are in parliament they have got every single thing they dreamt of and look where they've left the country and look what the party has been reduced to in the context of the current campaign take a deep breath Take a, take a long run up and tell me why this has been such an awful campaign. All right? 0345 6060 973. Why has this been so awful? There's something about the desperation on display today that cuts to the heart of what's been lost. Any semblance of integrity, any semblance of honesty, any semblance of consistency. You know, treating two politicians the same for the same behaviour, regardless of what party they came from. My, my profession is broken, has been for years, probably since Rupert Murdoch bought the sun, that, that decline began. But, but why has this campaign been so terrible? 0345 6060 973. It's 10.18. 20 minutes after 10 is the time. It's funny, yesterday we were inviting people with a deep understanding of French politics to explain to those who don't have a deep understanding of French politics what was going on with regard to the rise of the far right in, in recent polling. I suppose in a way today I'm asking people with a deep understanding of British politics to explain to people who are confused, perhaps even French, how a party of government can have been in power for 14 years and secured all manner of major victories and enjoyed the almost unanimous support of commercial media and yet 
preside over an election campaign of such unutterable awfulness that that it's arrived where it's arrived this morning. Uh, that, so explain it to someone who's not been paying attention why the Tory campaign is so, has been so bad. And it's trending on Twitter. It's not, it's not me saying this. It's a, a, a senior Tory leader, senior Tory figure describing it as the worst campaign of their lifetime. Let's just put together the, the, the jigsaw pieces that paint that picture. Sal's in Paddington to kick things off. Sal, what would you like to say? They knew right from the beginning that they had indeed gotten everything that they wanted for too long and mm. an elastic band that is stretched that far for that long will snap. When they, you know, from the very moment of the announcement, when you already knew that, you know, um, all of the um, notable names standing down, um, mm. they wouldn't even have a team to be able that, to... That was white flag uh, territory. Something. That was white flag Absolutely. territory, wasn't it? When When people like Dominic Raab instead of sticking around to enjoy the benefits of the Brexit that they championed, they, they, they've all they've all legged it. They brave Sir Robin ran away. Even the PM, you know, having having only been in um, as an MP for such a short period of time, never really knowing uh, opposition, um, who on earth do they have left to actually um, rally them? Um, when they all, they already had that many people stepping down. And yet, do you know, I, I was looking back at some of the coverage in 2019 and the, 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 the people were talking about Johnson being there for two or three terms. Sensible people talking seriously about Johnson looking being... Looking at the Parliament Act and thinking maybe we should bring in a two-term <laughs> cap like the US. <laughs> um, being immovable. Yeah. So that to go from that in 2019 when they thought they were going to be there forever to 2024 when they are describing their own campaign as the worst in living memory. You describe it as almost inevitable, as, 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 yeah. as if Sunak had very little um, agency in this, in this disaster. He and, didn't uh, choose a good time. He, choose the, he chose the, what he saw as the least worst time yes. to call the election. And he did that in the rain um, without remembering that, you know, he could get someone to hold an umbrella because he's yeah. a PM, um, even, or, uh, you know, or use the, the suite that we'd spent money on, um, that poor lectern. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, it's, if a week is a long time in politics, 14 years yes. is long enough. There was no way after, you know, because it's a pattern that we've seen before. It's a pattern that, that the Tory party had seen before. And they, you know, they were pretty much given up before they'd even started. Yeah, I, 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 I do. I do sometimes, not often, but I do sometimes wish that we could read minds or, or at least have some sort of insight. Didn't have to wait for the memoirs to come out. And, and, and even then, no guarantee they'll tell the truth. Or they could write a memoir like Nadine Doris's, which is absolutely no use to anybody. But I would love to know whether I, that theory that we teased ourselves with right at the beginning of this has become more plausible with every passing week that Rishi Sunak has done all everything that he's done can be explained by a desire to get it over and done with uh, to, to rip off the plaster and then move on to the next chapter of his life he's still a young man but it just seems unlikely but but um, Sal's point about the brevity of his period in parliament actually fits the idea that, oh, well, that's it, that hasn't worked out, let's go off and do something else. He's not someone that spent 20 years dreaming of getting his hands on the prize or has dedicated his entire life to political shenanigans and infighting and assembling support. I think another part of it that, that Sal alludes to is if you look at the cabinet, if, if you look at the talent puddle from which he was making key public appointments, as in jobs we, we know about, jobs we know the name of, and, and look at how terrible... That uh, pool or puddle was. Imagine what it was like behind the scenes. I, I, who was it the other day when I said something? So someone did something. A politician did something, and I joked to a colleague that he must have got Susan Hall's. Uh, he must have hired Susan Hall's advisor after the last mayoral election. And my colleague, who pays more attention to these things than I do, said, "No, no, he really did." He really did. 25 after 10 is the time. Why? Why has this Tory campaign been so terrible? How much of it? do you think is Rishi Sunak's fault or um, simply circumstances that he inherited? Simon is in Accrington. Simon, what would you like to say? Um, I don't think it's just a, a, a poor campaign by the Tories. I think it's a, I think it's just a general poor election. There's nothing to vote for. I was just telling you 
assistant man. Sorry, I'm a first time caller. Hey, take Sorry, your time. No, I mean, I, t- t- I mean, t- we're talking about a twenty point lead in, in in the polls for the Labour Party when the election was called, and and still today. So, I, I mean, mm. disillusion with what's on offer is one thing, but no one's going to be able to accuse the Labour Party of having run a bad campaign. Mm, Un- yeah, uninspi- was- uninspiring, perhaps, but the point of yeah, a campaign yeah. is to secure and maintain support, and they have done that. The Tories I- I are absolutely uh, lost at sea. Why, why do you think well, that is? Um, well, it's obviously because he he's part of the, the machinery that's got us to this position, right? Mm. He's, he's obviously kind of... And listen... I'll be straight. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm a working class. Nor do I, mate. You. Nor do I, mate. And I get paid. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah. But I, I guess. I guess. Like my opinion, because I mean, there, there was there was a time when I was like more receptive to to the yes. Tories, and I'm a pretty left leaning guy. Sure. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a I voted for Corbyn, and um, yeah. Well, I, I hear you talk about him, and I. It's only from lack of knowledge that I don't understand why you don't didn't like him, but that's besides the point. Um, right, there's a book yeah. I could there's a book I could recommend at this point, Simon, which has a, which has a whole chapter expl- answering the question that you've just asked. But it would be very very self serving of me to mention how they broke Britain currently at number five in the Sunday Times bestsellers. I've got a big list. I've got a big list of books, and one of them includes how, how much of how much of what we're seeing is down to Rishi Sunak, and how much of it is inheritance. Well, I mean, I, I made a really ridiculous point to life the other day, and I'm like, if this guy is so rich, he yeah. could literally save himself by turning around and going, do you know what? I'll take a load of my money and I'll bang it in to correct the I, NHS. I think, I, think, I think that. This is why you and I are never going to be that rich. Because I, I honestly <laughs> think, if you've got five, six, seven hundred million pounds in the bank, position for the rest you'd of just the turn world. around, wouldn't you, and say, look, I can't fix everything, but uh, you know, here's 200 million quid for the NHS. Yeah, it looks so good. I know. But again, I, I, don't, I, I think it's because maybe, oh, I call me a conspiracy theorist, maybe he's not really in charge, you know, maybe it's... Oh, he's, definite, maybe no, he's, definitely, he's definitely in charge, but I, 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 I suspect he'd be disowned by his father-in-law if he started giving away the family fortune in that fashion. There's a, there's a reason why the last Duke of Westminster, when he was asked why or, or for advice on, on being very, very wealthy, he said, uh, my advice to you would be to have an ancestor who was best friends with William the Conqueror. There's a reason why these great fortunes persist through the ages and a large part of it is not giving much of it away or indeed paying tax on, on, on a lot of it to the same level or the same scale that the rest of us are required to. Simon, thank you for that, your debut on the program. The time is 10.29. couple of phone lines free now. 0345 6060 I am intrigued by the question of inheritance, by, by the question of how much difference could a, a, a more obviously competent or a, or a more obviously charismatic leader have made. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm not apologising for not having an answer to that question. I honestly don't know. But I'm interested in what you think. As a senior Tory describes the campaign as the worst in his li- lifetime and newspapers report recriminations are now beginning to fly around. Um, could it have gone any differently? The failure to, to take on Farage until this week, and we've got some roundups of uh, what Reform UK Limited candidates have been doing and saying. Um, uh, but we've also got some very interesting research into what happens if you Google the words Nigel Farage blames and the long list of, of things that, that um, he holds responsible for his own problems and failures. But but why the Tories have failed to take the fight to them? Or, or is that part of it? Or, or, again, are we just looking at a set of circumstances Rishi Sunak inherited and over which he had next to no control? Half past ten is the time. Thomas Watts has your headlines. 10.34 is the time. I'll tell you what a joke I am. I, I, I was talking about Chris Evans' interview with Keir Starmer, in which he revealed, not for the first time, that he likes to have dinner with his family on Fridays. Uh, I, 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 last night, was absolutely transfixed by a Chris Evans' interview with Dennis Healy from, from a long, long time ago. Interviewed by Chris, Dennis Healy being interviewed by Chris Evans, Zig and Zag. You remember the, the puppets from, from The Big Breakfast? I, I tweeted it last night because it's a thing of absolute joy. I'm not going to tell you what Dennis Healy does in the middle of this interview because you won't believe me if I do tell you. Dennis Healy, uh, former Chancellor of the Exchequer, of course, I think for my money, and these are slightly throwaway lines, certainly uh, on the list of the best prime ministers we never had, although maybe John Smith 
would nudge him uh, in, 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 into second place. But the, the, it's a beautiful moment. And it just made me wonder what had happened to politics. Uh, and, and obviously this was after Healy's pomp. It wasn't during his days in, in, in power. But it, it was such a beautiful little vignette. That, that That's what I was looking at last night and, and tweeting when obviously everybody else was focusing on a rather more recent Chris Evans interview with a senior Labour politician. 10.35 is the time. Of all the quotes you've heard me repeat ad nauseam on the program all the all the quotes i love a quote i love i love the way a good quote can in a sentence or two sometimes sum up what would otherwise take pages to do you know i love a good quote which one do you think i've quoted most often during our time together apologies if you're if you're new uh, to, to to the show you'll be a little bit excluded from this which one do you think is the uh is the one i've shared the most i think since 2016 it's the orwell one isn't it I love the Steinbeck one about poverty. No such thing as poverty in the Dust Bowl era of America. Just temporarily frustrated millionaires. A couple of Chomskys in there. We love a bit of Chomsky. But I think it's the Orwell one. There was truth and there was untruth. And if you clung to the truth, even against the whole world, you were not mad. I read 1984 again a few weeks ago. It, it, is, it is an insanely good book, an absurdly good book. The understanding of human nature, never mind politics, was just beautiful. And, um, and, and that is part of Rishi Sunak's problem, isn't it? It's, and they're still not ready to admit it. This is what I think is going to detain us uh, in the aftermath of the general election result, if it goes the way that the polls suggest. What, what on earth happens to the Tory party next? Brexit hard man Steve Baker uh, throwing his hat into the ring, giving an interview last night in which he laid out what he believes to be leadership credentials. Tories can't even begin to rebuild their reputation until they have someone in charge who is completely detached from support for both Brexit and Boris Johnson. Uh, and they're nowhere near ready to do that. Nowhere near ready to do it. Which means that they are still clinging to the untruth, still clinging to the to the carcass of, of the last eight years. So Rishi Sunak's problem is that his party has abandoned the truth. He didn't necessarily have to. He was a Brexiter, but not a very prominent one. Uh, oh, no, Tom makes a good point. The quote, most recent quote, most often used is probably the Robbie Burns one, the Robert Burns one. Yeah, you could well be right on that. The one about seeing ourselves as other seers, which I always slightly butcher. But the I think a large part of Sunak's problem is that his party, the truth no longer matters. Uh, Maria Caulfield gave an interview this morning in which I think it's highlighted perfectly that, um, that they just lie so easily now. They just lie so comfortably that something quite significant has shifted. I may play it to you a little later. Uh, it, it's relevant also to the, to the story about Keir Starmer's Friday evenings, which we'll probably move on to in the next hour. Moise, Moez is in Reading. Moez, what, what's happened here? Why has it all been so awful for the Tories this campaign? Well, I can, my diagnosis of the uh, Tory decline on the lazy is quite simple, really. Um, uh, in, when Johnson came to power, there was a clear out of the... And you can argue about how talented they were and so on, but shall we say, uh, of the um, soft left or whatever of the... Well, dissent, party, call it dissent, dissent, out. dissenters who, who, who were clear-eyed about well, no deal Brexit in, in its simplest yeah. terms. Like the people who said we cannot contemplate a no deal Brexit, it would be an act of uh, unimaginable idiocy. We're just right, but they were fired so, for being right. Would that have made much difference if they were fighting this but, election now? So you have the concept of um, corporate memory. Yes. So within an organisation, you will have people who know simple things like where's the stationery covered? Yes. Or who's, who's uh, palm to grease in whatever yes. way or whatever. It may. Yeah, Those yeah, sorts yeah. of things. No, I like that. So yeah. there, there, is, there is an element of that. The other thing is, of course, that... Corporate memory, um, I like that a lot. Like literacy almost. So we'll get yeah. John, he knows within how to speak. He knows how to speak have... to these people. Yeah, go talk to Fred. He knows how yeah. uh, which widget fits in which which thing. How and they got rid of done. some of that, both behind all, the scenes all, and and, and, and front and centre. Yeah, and then and the new boys and girls came in, and frankly, um, all the red wallers and all the rest of it, they came in, and they really didn't know what they were doing, and uh, maybe they were all um, 
gallons or whatever term you want to use. Sure. But the point is that they didn't have that knowledge. They hadn't had time to acquire they that thought knowledge. They, were, they thought they were geniuses with, with yeah. enormous mandates and unbounded impunity, but they were actually all a little bit rubbish at everything. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, you've got um, COVID comes along and any illusion of competence. And I, I, I'd have to look... I haven't had a chance to look at it, but if you were to look at the um, different surveys, et cetera, where they could polls that were taken before and during COVID, man, the Tories were well ahead. Mm. And Starmer was was not doing too well in terms of... There was a, by, there was a by-election defeat that prompted talk of him resigning, wasn't there? I mean, exactly. it would, yeah. Yes, there was. So COVID, the aftermath of COVID was the thing. So after COVID... You then had all the party scams and all the rest of it. And that destroyed a lot. People were no longer prepared to listen to the Tories. We were no longer prepared to give them, uh, shall we say, benefit of the doubt. Mm. Then you have added to that um, the the weakness of, firstly, you've got Liz Trust. The fact that he wasn't wanted as the leader, so they chose Liz Trust. She was an even worse disaster in her 49 days or however long it was. The, the Lady Jane Grey of, of Prime Ministers, <laughs> off she goes. Um, and pretty much any credibility he might have had by saying, I'm going to come in and save the country, was then destroyed by the fact that he he showed weakness. Mm. He brought back Sir Bradman and all the rest of it. So in terms of the Tory party, you have all these things. Now, I know you like to go on about the right-wing press. I don't go on about yes, anything, you, you do, cheeky, you, you, ch- you cheeky yeah, fella. I mean, if, if if I get more, uh, the next 20 seconds, I'll tell you Go what on. I really came cool to say. But anyway, but the point is, the papers aren't what they were. No, they're not. And, that, that, and that, that, they can't quite process that, can they? Nor can people in, in broadcasting who, who are kind of neck deep in uh, the old Murdoch power structure. It yes. just doesn't work anymore. It's like, it's like when you're having a dream and you try and punch someone, but your arm goes all floppy. Do you know what yeah. I mean? That anxiety so, dream, or you scream and nothing comes out. That's what the right-wing newspapers look a bit like now, although obviously the politicians still pay an awful lot of attention to what they're doing. Yeah, but the but the other thing was that, and this is where I guess you and I will part company in a, um, oh. in a major way. Yeah. But I, I know you've, when I use the term, you have a hard-on for Cole Corbyn, as in... You really don't particularly like it. And I know you've written a book, and at some point I'll probably get around to reading so it. So unelectability is, 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 was the key problem with Corbyn in 2019. Uh, absolute well, unelectability, well, we, which, which is proven. I don't, I don't want to... I, I know you have no great desire to relitigate really really 2017, but we could talk about how... Well, I, I have right at length. 2017 was, was a vote for many people holding their nose because they thought it was the only way to uh, re- review or revisit And at the Brexit. same time, the party machinery... And again, we, it goes down to the competence of the party machinery or the willingness of the party machinery to back you once you are leader. Um, party machinery is quite happy to... Why are, we uh, talking about this in, in, why are we talking about this in the context of why the Tory campaign is so awful? Because there is one other thing which hasn't... Which I believe relates to... Cor- well, forget Corbyn, but relates yeah, to a, a narrative which is essentially now that the... Left has been seen off. The Tories are in a deep hole. The, uh, shall we say, the view... Of, and when I use the term the establishment, I don't mean the deep state and all that crap. What I mean is... Just watch your language slightly, Moez, if you would. A, a, a couple of phrases there that are a, a, a little infelicitous for half for, for quarter to 11 in the morning. And, and, and I'm sure we can both do better. But just, just move to your central point. OK, my central point is essentially that... Now that Starmer, moderate, centrist, whatever you want to call them, is in charge, yep. and the Tories are in the hole, the, shall we say, the scrutiny that might otherwise have been... Dis- and I'm glad the Tories are going to go down a hole. Yep. Don't get me wrong on this. It's just the point. But the scrutiny I would have liked to have seen on some of the things that Starmer has said right. and done, I have not seen. Okay, so Starmer's getting an easy ride from from the UK media. I I don't know what time you got up this morning, mate, but he's currently getting kebabbed for having tea on Fridays. 0345 973 is the number you need if you want to uh, contribute to the question of why this Tory campaign has gone so badly for the Tories, according to at least one, well, in fact, according to all of them behind the scenes. But the, 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 the selection of circumstances, if you like, the... Uh, the congregation 
of circumstances or something that Rishi Sunak brought personally to the to the table. It's just coming up to quarter to 11. 10.47 is the time you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Uh, a candidate from which party? I can't really say this word on the radio, can I? Um... You know the, the the pejorative term for a female dog, okay? So, which a member, a candidate, an actual candidate for which party, advocated for Nicholas Sturgeon to be shot and called J.K. Rowling a wild bleep. Um, I, 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 I shall reveal that shortly. Uh, also, um, same person used social media to call Christine Lagarde, the president of the European Central Bank, the head bleep of the globalists and told female journalists that men would not want to sleep with them. Right? What, what, does that, what does that make you think of? What party does that make you think of? Uh, and, uh, of course, all answers are acceptable. Um, there was also a foul-mouthed tirade in which Ursula von der Leyen was targeted. He's used slurs against gays and lesbians and likened the rainbow symbol used on posters supporting the NHS during COVID as the new swastika. So what, what, what party do you think this chap is a candidate for? Um, absolutely no prizes for guessing. 10.48 is the time. And he's in Stoke Newington to steer us back to the Conservative campaign. And the question in a way, Andy, of I mean, behind the question of why has it all gone so wrong or why has it all been so awful lies the arguably bigger question of whether it actually had to be like this, whether there was any alternative universe in which things would have gone better. What would you like to say? Uh, hi, James. Thanks for having me on. Uh, yeah, I, I think the reason they're in a problem now is that I think one is for Sunak, he's not getting the backing from the party. Uh, two, the mm. Rwanda problem, uh, because if he had left calling the election too soon, if he had left it later, basically he'd have been in a position where the Rwanda policy wouldn't have worked and they've based everything since Brexit on the Rwanda See, policy I, 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 and yeah, immigration. You're the first person to mention Rwanda, and, and, and I'm glad that you have. Because I, I was kind of listening to Moez, the, the, the last caller, I was kind of running through that list of things that are pivotal moments in, in this collapse or this decline and wondering what the biggest one was. But Sunak had no control over Boris Johnson's premiership or over Brexit or over quite a lot yeah. of the things that have contributed to the conservative malaise. The Rwanda thing is arguably the biggest element of, of this situation, isn't it? Because it, 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 it failed, and yet he's <clears throat> campaigning on it being a success. So that detachment exactly. from the truth is never clearer than in that, in that single policy issue. Yeah, I mean, that's been the crux of their, 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 their line. And that hasn't worked. Mm. Uh, so he, he's got to, he, he'd be in a worse position if he tried to uh, set an election and it had already failed. At least he can say, well, it, it hasn't failed as yet because we don't know. But so, it doesn't so look like it's going to go early. through. So that's why he went early. Well, I, I think, but the, the, whole, the whole thing anyway, what, what I would really love is I would love for someone like you to actually take a look at issues that no one in the media really talks about. Uh, you know, and the reason why, why I feel that we Brexited, because basically uh, uh, the new law that they brought in from the European Union, transparency and offshore money, that came on the 1st of January 2016, that Cameron knew about in 2008. It's, yeah, and I, the European I, I, Union... Yeah, go on, I am across this. Because it's not, basically it's, it's not, it's, we, it, wash, yeah, we wash their money through our offshore systems... And yeah, which, this isn't why the Tory campaign is going so badly, from, is it? No, it isn't. It's a bit, it, and, and you're perfectly entitled to have your pet hobby horses, but the, the, the quite a lot of the online commentary on that legislation is 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 not correct, and it has absolutely well, nothing to do with the with the failure of the current Tory campaign. So, I, I mean, that's certainly why we're not talking about it today, because it's got absolutely nothing to do with what we are talking about. So you don't feel that's had any relevance to do with with uh, uh, Brexit, offshore and 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 no, European I don't, no, Union I, I, I honestly, I, no, I, I honestly don't. No I mean, if you're suggesting if you're suggesting that it inspired some of Brexit's wealthy supporters, then then you may have a point. But Brexit was a result of of 17 million people voting for it, Andy, I, and and the, the reasons why they did it. 
had absolutely nothing to do with um, offshore financial regulations and everything to do with the way in which they were persuaded immigrants are the, are the bane of their existence and, and responsible for everything that's wrong in their lives. And then you had 20 or 30 years of Eurosceptic rhetoric comparing the European Union to the um, the EU SSR or the Fourth Reich. You had the post-Second World War um, justifiable suspicion of a Europe in which Germany exercised power and you had the misrepresentation of how the parliament worked, the misrepresentation of the impact that it had upon our legal system. So, I, listen, I, simple explanations on Facebook, very, very seductive, rarely helpful. Jim's in Haroldwood. Jim, what would you like to say? Hey, James, how's it going? Very well, Jim. What's on? Is it a full moon at the moment? Do we know? Uh, no, don't know. <laughs> Carry on. Sorry. Uh, so I've got a couple of points. So the first one, is, I think, is the obvious one, which is the Tories have nothing positive to offer. So it's all just about you know, what Labour might do. And I think that one's pretty clear. But the one I want you to get into is the fact that even if Sunak got back in by some miracle, mm. we, we, there's no security that he'd actually still be there in six months' time. Now, whatever you say about Starmer, I think, yeah, people talk about him culling the left and all the rest of it, which I don't agree with. But I think what he's done is get around him a team and a sense of security. So from a public perspective, if you look at it, you've got a guy who, whether you agree with everything he says or not, you, you think, well, he'll have a bit of longevity in him. He'll probably at least get through why, why, why do you think? Why do you think Sunak would arrive with, with, with a potentially short shelf life? Just because of the way they've dealt with the previous two or three prime ministers? I think just generally the, the Tory party isn't really a single party, is it? It's a, it's a bunch of factions under a yeah. single flag. And I think you've actually said before in your show, I think you've named, what, eight or ten different factions of the Tory party, which really illustrates the point, all having their own little leader out there. You know, even Trust has their own one at the moment, which is baffling. Um, so even if he got through and got a mandate, I think he sees this as an opportunity to go back to his party to go, look, people actually do want me in charge, which we all know... It's probably more to his personality flaws than anything else to even think that's possible. But even if he got through, I don't think that would stop the likes of Braverman, Patel, Badenoch looking over his shoulder and trying to get. Oh, I see what you mean. So, 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 so not only have they become detached from the truth, they've come detached from the purpose of politics. It's been completely, and I suppose Boris Johnson and Liz Truss are both rival apotheoses of this. It's become entirely about pursuing personal ambition. The, the, the upper oh, echelons of the Conservative Party exist solely to facilitate the personal ambitions of senior Tory politicians, which is why Cammy Badenoch's in the newspapers all the time at the moment. Absolutely. I mean, I think Go we've on. got enough evidence now to be completely honest about it and say they are 100% in it for themselves. And I've made this point before with colleagues who kind of mm. laugh, but I think How you dare know, they? politicians generally... How dare they? You need new <laughs> colleagues. Politicians are generally, I don't think, and I know this is really controversial, I don't think they're paid well enough. And this is why you get these people who come in who don't need the money, because £80,000 a year when you could be earning hundreds of thousands in the city is nothing. They don't need the money. They come in to influence policy. It's a case of... It's basically inside of trading because trading, you're mm. moving the market to your whim, selling contracts to your friends, or just benefiting off of you know the move. I don't the think they the realise that. Done. I don't think that's conscious. I, I think I, I mean there is a book to be written if it hasn't already about just solely about COVID contracts and and their aftermath and Sunak's subsequent refusal properly to investigate uh, what had actually gone on. But there is something there. Carol Vorderman and I t talked about this when she came on Full Disclosure. She's a much more um, doughty advocate of this worldview than I am, that, that we struggle to understand the impulse when the country is faced with a national disaster. We struggle to understand the impulse that says there's an opportunity for me to make lots of money. And yet that impulse seems now to, to run through the Conservative Party like Blackpool through a stick of rock. And that's not the Conservative Party of a Michael Heseltine or, or, or even a Ken Clark, both of whom are very wealthy men in their own right, especially Heseltine. But, but for a national disaster to be on the horizon and the Conservative Party to be both in the pockets of and in cahoots with people who see COVID and see pound signs, I think that does speak to a, to, to a deeper truth, actually. 10.56 is the time. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. And I, I don't know if this tallies with um, with that point that Jim just made, but Pete Foster's just sent me this, which is in um, Tim Shipman's new book. Uh, 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 Pete Foster, if you, if you don't know, uh, the, the policy editor at the Financial Times and one of the most clear-eyed chroniclers of Brexit. But this, this speaks to part of what we're describing, and it goes all the way back to Theresa May. This paragraph from um, 
fallout, uh, the, the, the book by Tim Shipman of the Sunday Times, senior civil servants in Cabinet were shocked not only that no deal was suddenly an option, but also at the reasons given. One said, all around the table, they said, if the choice is the Conservative Party staying together and no deal, or the Conservative Party fracture and an extension, then the national interest is in the Conservative Party staying together. It was one of those moments when you realise that you've been complacent about ideology in politics. They really believe it was the Conservative Party that made Britain great. They had internalised this mythology. That's a senior civil servant talking to Tim Shipman. So when the cabinet minutes were written, the civil servant responsible made a point of including the observation that ministers had equated the national interest with that of the Tory party. Um, and when one of May's people spotted that this had been included in the minutes, May was furious and demanded that it be changed. The mandarins refused. So when we talk about the paucity of talent upon which to draw for the Tories, we forgot, didn't we, the attacks on the civil service as well. So you've got this almost cultish belief, beautifully described there. And, and like Peter Foster, I hadn't clocked quite how... Uh, quite how significant that moment was i hadn't i hadn't fully appreciated it so you've got that talent puddle constantly diminishing and remember theresa may still had people like philip hammond and uh ken clark and nicholas Sones or anna subri or rory stewart whoever it is in her tent but the ta- that rapidly diminishing talent puddle both for the political appointments and the backroom advisor appointments, coupled with the attacks on the civil service caused by this cultish belief that the national interest and the party interest were the same. And all of this creating the ecosystem that, into which Rishi Sunak became prime minister. I don't know whether that makes it more compelling, that there was absolutely nothing he could do about the current um, campaign, or whether it makes it less compelling. It is 10.59. We'll stay with elements of this, but we will now bring in the story that dominates political discourse this morning um it would be a little remiss of me to ask you to come up with a clever question about the revelation that keir starmer has dinner with his wife on fridays um who do you think this was about in 2012 Uh, he has revealed that he and his wife look forward to a weekly date night spent alone at home together or at one of a number of undisclosed restaurants as a means of keeping the romance in their relationship fresh we have one night a week where we either stay in and do nothing or go out on our own he told now magazine yeah, that was David Cameron, who was actually Prime Minister at the time. But, but I don't remember people queuing up to claim that that somehow meant that the Russians would be able to invade. Three minutes after 11, that is an extraordinary intervention. Uh, we sometimes change our plans on the programme according to what's in the news bulletin. And of course, there are other times we, we completely miss the news bulletin and end up coming back 10 minutes later, setting up a hook and tease that's already been answered by, uh, by, Tom, by Thomas Watts or by Amelia. Um, that's extraordinary for the government's own anti-Semitism czar or advisor, whatever you prefer, to condemn the government for its attacks on Keir Starmer. Not just the government as well. Plenty of journalists been joining in on this as well. I, I, it's given me a little bit of confidence in my own convictions on this. It's sometimes hard, particularly when you do this for a living, to see the wood for the trees. But I felt that this was even perhaps without the Jewish element of the story, I thought it was one of the most ridiculous attempted hit jobs, probably the most ridiculous since the Mail on Sunday went after Keir Starmer for buying a field that his disabled mother could keep donkeys in. I, I now add the word disgusting to, to this attempt this morning to portray Keir Starmer's decision to traditional decision to observe Shabbat or Friday night dinner with his Jewish wife and and on on many occasions her father. I think it is one of the most disgusting elements of electioneering that we've seen in a very, very long time. And I did mention this at quarter to 10 this morning on my little trail that comes in uh, shortly before the end of Nick's show when I asked, is this actually anti-Semitic to attack him for doing something that is essentially a consequence of his wife's Jewish faith? And it is, isn't it? Or at least if it isn't, why the heck is the government's own anti-Semitism advisor weighing in on the issue and pointing out that uh, that this is utterly unacceptable? It, it ties with the conversation we were having in the previous hour. It, it ties with the abject awfulness of the Conservative campaign, but it cuts to a deeper truth about what the Conservatives have become, 
what this party has become. That's why I'm obsessing slightly over this this uh, paragraph in uh, in Tim Shipman's book, which um, I, I uh, share. It's my mate Pete Foster has sent me it, saying, "Crikey, I'd, I'd missed this at the time," and 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 commenting on how blown away he is by it. This this cannot be overemphasized. The fact that. This, this was under May. This was, you know, before Johnson and the madness of trust. They really did believe that the prioritizing Conservative Party unity over the national interest, they honestly believed that the Conservative Party's interest was the national interest. That's a mark of, um, that's a mark of cultish delusion. And that was under Theresa May, who sometimes gets an easy ride and, and is, I don't think, anywhere near as bad as much of what followed but that that is huge and for john mann to wade in this morning now um with a condemnation of what they've done with regard to keir starmer's friday nights is i, I mean it's actually breathtaking i can't remember the last time that happened so i am going to ask you a really straightforward question and i, I want to remind you that you're you're not just entitled but positively encouraged sometimes to to, to 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 leaven my loaf to to tell me that I'm I'm wrong or that I um or, or to, to 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 dial down my volume if you like not literally you won't be able to hear me but to uh, to what's the word I'm looking for I don't know why I'm thinking of Goldilocks and the porridge you you you're allowed to cool my porridge that doesn't sound right at all does it no you stay away from my porridge you you're allowed to tell me that it, that it's so look I'm about to say how disgusting is this I I, I I felt that this morning's coverage of Keir Starmer's utterly uncontroversial conversation with the with the great Chris Evans, I thought some of the coverage of it was gross, actually. And I thought either pretending not to notice or pretending not to care that his observance of, of Friday night dinner or Shabbat was a large part of the reason why he seeks to avoid work after 6 p.m. on a Friday was, as I said to you not long ago, if it had been the other way round, if it had been a left-wing uh, politician or a left-wing commentator attacking a right-wing family or, or the family of a right-wing politician for observing Friday night dinner, I, I don't know that we ever would have heard the end of it. But oddly, such is the state of the British media and the current Conservative Party, it, 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 it spent several hours going in entirely the opposite direction until Lord Mann, appointed an anti-Semitism advisor by Theresa May, said, the attack on Keir Starmer for asserting his right to family time on a Friday night, as he has done for many, many years, is so dangerous, so insidious from those aware of why he chooses to be with his family specifically on Friday evenings. It's a very strange thing to attack over. I'm the independent advisor to the Prime Minister and my advice would be this is not an area to stray into. So how disgusting is it? 0345 973 And I don't know if we can um, distance ourselves from, from tribal loyalties. I think we should try. I, I struggle sometimes, I, I, as, as I'm sure you've noticed. But you need to imagine that this was the other way round. And would you feel the same? You know, I, I think actually an earlier caller mentioning uh, Jeremy Corbyn is quite helpful in this context because the accusation of footballification among Labour supporters who were supremely unimpressed by the last leader falls apart immediately. We, we proved that we are perfectly capable of holding our own people, if you like, in negative opinions. Uh, I don't know on this one how it would play out if a senior conservative sought to spend Friday evenings with their Jewish partner as part of Shabbat and got attacked for doing so or simply for saying that he tries to by a left-wing politician. So I think the word anti-Semitism does have a, a resonance here. It does actually apply here. And it's odd, isn't it, that it is now being demonstrated or being done by people who ordinarily use it as a weapon to hit everybody uh, who protests against the ongoing carnage in Gaza. It's quite incredible, really, to see that um, to play out in real time, play out in the public space. So I was wondering at 10 o'clock this morning, 
whether or not we should even talk about this story of, of Keir Starmer's Friday night dinners. John Mann has, has crystallised my thoughts. We absolutely should. But, but I want you to tell me what, what this says to you. OK, but from, from whatever angle you're coming at it, what, you might be Jewish. You might be a, a, a died in the world Tory. You might think it's a load of old nonsense. You might. And I would struggle to believe you. But you I, I, I give you the benefit of the doubt. You might honestly believe that it's a story of political significance, that if, for example, something of enormous national importance happened at 10 past six on a, on a Friday evening, Keir Starmer would turn around and say, I'm terribly sorry. I, I, I'm, I'm busy until tomorrow morning. It's so obviously ridiculous. But is it actually disgusting? Does it move into the realms of, as Lord Mann suggests, dangerousness? Hit the numbers now, you will get through. 0345 6060 973 is the number that you need. I, I thought it was ridiculous. I thought it was like Keir Starmer's curry or his uh, late mother's donkey sanctuary or indeed Angela Rayner's housing arrangements. I just thought it was more evidence of desperation from the Tories, but the Prime Minister's anti-Semitism advisor has described it as dangerous. Do you agree? 0345 6060 973. Um, just to finish off a hook and tease from earlier, I asked you, which party do you imagine a candidate who advocated for Nicholas Sturgeon to be shot and called J.K. Rowling a wild bleep um, belongs to? He also um, attacked gays and lesbians and likened the rainbow symbol used on posters supporting the NHS during COVID to, quote, the new swastika. Absolutely no prizes if you correctly guessed that this character is a Reform UK limited candidate. And he's not the only one in the news today. Speaking of people from that side of the political spectrum, Steve Bannon is now in prison. I don't know whether you've picked up on this story. Donald Trump's former top aide reported for a four-month sentence yesterday for contempt of Congress, which makes the story about the Supreme Court handing Donald Trump the, the ace of spades for fascists throughout history yesterday. The impunity from prosecution, the idea that if you're president, you can't commit crimes almost. Um, puts that in a slightly different light, doesn't it? The fact that his key consigliere, his top aide, a man who Nigel Farage, of course, thanked uh, and said that Brexit wouldn't have happened without Steve Bannon. He is now in jail. But it is to domestic politics that we dedicate ourselves for this hour. And the, and the question is, what this attempt to attack Keir Starmer for observing... Shabbat on Friday evenings, keeping Friday nights free from work. Whether or not you think John Mann is right when he uses the word dangerous to describe what the Tory party and some of their, um, shall we say, slightly over-enthusiastic friends in the right-wing media have been doing this morning. The number you need is 0345 6060 I am also going to have the conversation that I wanted to have this hour. I don't want to talk exclusively about the, the details or the dangerousness, uh, the disgusting nature of, of this manufactured criticism, I am really interested in generational change with regard to the work-life balance. Um, I went home on Thursday, uh, or rather I left the studio very, very early for, for a family emergency. I don't think I would have done that 10 years ago. I, I think I would have said, no, I have to, it's absolutely essential that I stay on air. Uh, you don't understand. I, 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 my dad's generation would, would have seen work as above and beyond almost all other considerations. How many people of your dad's generation have you heard say, I wish I'd spent more time with the children or I wish I'd spent more time with the family? We almost defined ourselves by the hours that we put in, you know, rolling our sleeves up. And, and I love the fact that Keir Starmer, who's much older than me, 10 years nearly older than me, uh, I love the fact that he recognizes the importance of making time for your family. In fact, there is a little clip from a, a politician. I don't know if you've heard of him. He's, he's called Rishi Sunak, talking very specifically about Keir Starmer's attitude to his family. You may recognise the person that he's talking to as well. well. I think actually when I hear him talk, these jobs all take a toll on everyone's family. And I think he does a very good job of balancing, you know, family life and work life and, and making sure that he prioritises that and makes time for it. And I think when you hear him talk about that, that's, uh, that, that's a nice thing. Uh, quarter past 11, Rishi Sunak there answering Nick Ferrari's question about what he admires about Keir Starmer. And, and I agree 
finding time for your family, making time for your family is, is, a, is not just a, a, an important attribute. I think it's a, a, a rather inspirational one. So we'll talk about that. And we'll also talk about Lord Mann's description of attacks on Keir Starmer for spending Friday evenings with his family as dangerous. It's 11.15. It is 17 minutes after 11. We may once again be victims of our own success here. A switchboard groaning under the weight of people uh, keen to talk specifically about these ludicrous and arguably anti-Semitic attacks on Keir Starmer this morning from elements of the Conservative Party and the right-wing client media. So at the moment, I haven't got any room for the conversation I was intending to have about work-life balance and generational change and the recognition among men of my age and older that we need to be different from our fathers when it comes to finding time for and prioritising the needs of our families. So we, we may get on to that later. But first, Peter is in Hampton Hill. Peter, what made you pick up the phone? Yeah, I just saw what you're talking about there, James. Mm. Excuse me, I'm a bit of a cold and flu today. But, um, I you do sound, you sound like you're about on. to say a second class return to Dottingham, please. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Excuse me, yeah. Very no, I, first, I first heard the um, story at 8 o'clock, about 8 o'clock when I first turned on to Nick Ferrari. Right. And I listened for about two minutes, and I just like, I just thought this is really outrageous and yes. like disgusting. You know what I mean? And I have, and, um, I have a lot of respect for you and your opinions, but um, well, don't don't, don't make it about don't don't make it about Nick. There's well, plenty of other people that have weighed uh, in on this as well, so we can talk yeah, more yeah. broadly. I think. I, I mean, he'd be more than happy to defend himself. I'm sure if you gave him a ring, it's it's not it, a, not something he has a problem with. But but talk about the broader issue. Let's talk about. I mean the the the. the conservative or, or rather the independent advisor on anti-semitism using the word dangerous as i like you initially just thought this is ridiculous but is it yeah, dangerous I, I, I don't know well i didn't make that connection in the beginning i just mm. but i got so outraged by it i had to turn off the radio mm. you know because not feeling well or anything i thought oh you you know I, I thought you just turned so, off your phone then as well the phone line's gone a bit south peter I, we, we, we may return to you in a second mark's in bexley mark what would you like to say oh hi james hello um, First, first time caller. Welcome. Um, a little bit nervous. Um, it's only me. <laughs> um, yeah, I just think that it's kind of like a, a lazy stereotype. Um, I do think it's anti-Semitic. Um, if you've got, like, say, Jewish colleagues, um, a lot of in the winter months, um, because it goes dark around sort of like four o'clock in the afternoon, yes, you'll actually get uh, Jewish colleagues having to go, say, like at three o'clock, so they make sure that they get home for when it goes dark to start. That, that's a, I think that's a more of an, an, an orthodox observation, isn't it? As yeah. a, as a per, which which um, they, they're clearly not, yeah. but but it doesn't matter. That, that, that is why Friday nights are, for want of a, a, a... Possibly it's the perfect word. Friday nights are sort of sacrosanct for Starmer, but it's yeah. subliminal it, anti-Semitism you're describing. That's the word Dave's just used. I just... I feel like it's like... It, it's a lazy stereotype in the sense of like, the, oh, they're clocking off early. Um, they're oh, going home. Okay. Um, and especially like, um, you know, like in Jewish schools, for example, uh, the, the pupils have to go home early uh, in the winter months because, again, they want to get home because the Shabbat starts at sunset. Um, so I just think that, yeah. Oh, I hadn't thought of it as playing to, to that because I don't know that people like Grant Shapps this morning are consciously trying to trigger anti-Semitic tropes. I don't think either of us no. are saying that, are we? I don't think they meant it. I think it's like it's more of a hindsight when you look back. So what they'll be doing now is, is, oh, rats, we wouldn't have done this if we'd properly realised the role that his wife's Judaism plays in the yeah. whole story. We've, we've, we've blown up this enormous balloon and, and now we can't control it. I think so. Mm. I mean, if, if they're, you know, if Keir Starmer, I don't know if he's a Christian, but if he said, I want to spend an hour going to Mass on a Sunday... Um, would it be a massive story or would it be a, a target for, for like, beating him over the head with? Probably not. Mm. I mean, I, to be fair, I suppose, to, to some of the people who have rather embarrassed themselves today, the interview with Chris Evans on, on his radio show that didn't go into specific detail, I don't think, about the religious element of the story, but the very most simplest, most simple of Googles, the most simple of searches would have thrown up both the um, uh, podcast interview that he did with 
uh, with Lenny and Jessie Ware, the, 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 the pop star and her mum, who are absolutely lovely people. I've done that podcast myself. And indeed, the coverage of it in, for example, the Jewish Chronicle. So the reasons why his Friday nights are special are absolutely in the public domain. And they, and they chose their for to either not do any due diligence or to completely ignore it in the hope of landing some punches on, on Keir Starmer. Would you reach for Dangerous? Um, like John I mean, Mann has done? For, for me personally, I think it's quite a positive story that, you know, he does respect and love his family, that he does want to, you know, even though he's not Jewish himself, he res- he's respectful, um, you know, uh, of of the Jewish faith and it's it's such an important part of being Jewish um even like Jews that may may say that they've lost their faith they they still see Friday yeah, night the, as, the, the ritual as the, an, the, the, as a, the as tradition a ritual. yes I, and it's it's a, it's a rather lovely one actually i, I, I mean yeah. it, it ties with the, the whole notion of family being at the center of um, at, at the center of life. Shaps, I, I, quite a few of you are telling me, is uh, himself Jewish. And so the idea that he would be consciously triggering anti-Semitic tropes does seem fanciful. Um, I, I, I don't know that you can necessarily say that about everybody who's got stuck into this story today. John's in gold as green. John, what would you like to say? Uh, good morning. Well, Hello. the first thing I'd like to say is that uh, people not, may, may remember Joe Lieberman, who in 2000 was a senator and was a vice presidential candidate for, for Barack uh, Obama. For, 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 yes, for yeah. Barack Obama. Now, he was an orthodox Jew. And if he had actually, uh, you know, while he was a senator, and uh, if he had in fact been uh, vice president, uh, he would have not only taken Friday evening off, but he would have taken the entire Sabbath off. Gosh. And I didn't hear one word from the American people uh, about him being a part-time senator or a part-time vice president. Uh, having said that, mm. I don't think that the um, comments today were actually intended to be anti-Semitic. I think they would have been the same comments if he said, I'm taking Wednesday afternoon off uh, or or setting aside Sunday night uh, for family night. Um, The fact that it, it, you know, the fact that it was Friday night and he's got a Jewish wife just adds a bit of spice to it. Yes, uh, and in that sense, I think I, I, I hope I hope you're right. The but, but shouldn't have actually owned his mouth because yeah. it just adds fuel to the fire again and and legitimises the fact that it could have been anti-Semitic, and I don't think it was. Well, David Cameron revealed in 2012, uh, two years into his premiership, that he and his wife have a date night every week, spent alone at home together at one of a number of undisclosed restaurants, um, uh, or, or, or at home, and and no one picked up on that. Suella Braverman has revealed relatively recently while Home Secretary that her and her Jewish husband observe Friday night dinner and neither of them came under attack. So the bias here is actually the rather traditional and stupid, stupidly obvious bias against Keir Starmer as opposed to a story that is coloured by the religion of his wife. Am I still on? Yes. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. I don't think it was anti-Semitic. I just, right. and, 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 uh, I, well, no, I, you said intentionally. Think, and, that's why, and that's why I think that what's been going on this morning with Nick Ferrari. Uh, well, hang on. There's been far too, there's been far too many comments or, or, or uh, the, the conversations are legitimate one to have on a radio program, but it's the, the Jewish element I think has been overemphasized. And, and uh, are you Jewish yourself, John? Yes, I am. Yes, but I, it's relevant. I, I don't know whether it's relevant or not. I was just interested. I, I think it gives you an extra layer of, of credibility in, in, in making that observation. I, I certainly feel that Jewish people, are often better placed than the rest of us to, to comment on, on whether or not something is anti-Semitic, or at least your feelings are more important on the issue than mine, although there are, are clearly plenty of people of the same faith who um, who disagree with you. It is 25 minutes after 11. I think it was Al Gore's vice presidential nominee, um, uh, Joe Lieberman, as opposed to Barack Obama's, but I could be wrong. Lisa's in Hendon. Lisa, what would you like to say? Hi. Hello. Um- So I would like to say that in 30 years of being a lawyer in the top city firms and observing Shabbat, I've never had an issue. I've never been made to feel that really I ought to stay till 6.01 or that I'm a part-time lawyer. Good. And that was 30 30 years ago in the early 90s that I started working in that way. So to hear this now levelled at someone who's only said they would like to try and have family meals and knock off at six o'clock is an incredible step backwards and a real cheap shot by the Tories. And as a Tory voter, I'm I'm appalled, or someone who was going to vote Tory, I'm just appalled. 
So, you, you, I, well, there, there are two people, both of, of the Jewish faith, coming at it from very different angles. You think that the Jewishness of Keir Starmer's wife is absolutely intrinsic to this story? Well, I think they wouldn't have said it otherwise, because Keir Starmer wouldn't be wanting to knock off work at 6.01 otherwise. No, or, or so, keeping Friday nights sacrosanct, keeping Friday nights special for the family. Yeah, yeah, and I think also in a period when everybody's so much more aware of mental health and yes. the effects of overwork, um, the fact that he's carving out this time with his wife and family should be applauded. He's not saying that if there's a national emergency, he'll disappear and he won't be contactable. No, I mean, that, that was the bit. I think I saw, was it Greg Hands tweeted something like, what if Putin invades? And I just thought, how low are we going to go before Thursday? I mean, the idea that Keir Starmer is sitting having dinner with his wife and his father-in-law and his two children, and someone rings to say, Vladimir Putin's just invaded Hendon. And he'd say, terribly sorry, it's Friday night. I'm not going to... I mean, it just doesn't even merit laughing at, does it, Lisa? No, it doesn't. And I think it's, it's come at a time when Jewish people are feeling incredibly sensitive in this country anyway, due to the anti-Semitic attacks. Um, unfortunately, my daughter suffered one such attack. I'm sorry. Um, and we know of many, many other families. And previously, even 10 years ago, mm. it was almost unheard of. Sure, you might get a co somebody leaning out of a car shouting something occasionally if the situation was, um, was difficult over in the Middle East. But now it's reached levels where many of us... <coughs> are frightened to walk the streets alone or won't wear visible um, badges or evidence of our faith. So now to have the Conservatives, who are you know, a big, respected political party and have been in power for the last 40 and a half years, come mm. along and take a shot like that at someone's religious faith, it, it, it's too sensitive and very ill thought out. I, I, well, I mean, at the very least... It, 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 for the reasons that you describe, it is an area in which you'd expect them to be. Walk, you'd expect all public figures to be walking on eggshells, at the very least. I, I, but I, I mean, you know, John in Gold is Green, Lisa in Hendon, coming at it from the same faith and completely different points, which is really interesting. One making the point that it doesn't, the Jewishness has nothing to do with the criticism. It's just a, an anti-labour bias. At least pointing out that you can't perhaps separate one from the other. You know, it is the reason why he finishes work or seeks to finish work, as Lisa reminds us, to pretend that Greg Hans did actually tweet that. I thought I'd imagined it. He actually tweeted, what if Putin attacks at 6.01 p.m.? So he is obviously being profoundly dishonest. There's no earthly way even someone as stupid as Greg Hans thinks that if Putin attacked this country at one minute past six, the serving prime minister would say, I'm terribly sorry, I'm having my dinner and my family time. I'm not going to engage with the fact that a foreign state has just invaded Hendon. That's such an unplay. I mean, good Lord, every time you think they can't go any lower, up they pop. It's half past 11. Thomas Watts has your headlines. It is 33 minutes after 11. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. This is nice from another James. It could be worse. A foreign secretary could ditch his security detail and go partying with Russian oligarchs after a Russian chemical attack on British soil. I wonder how many people pretending to be furious with Keir Starmer for observing Shabbat with his Jewish wife on Friday evenings um, uh, managed to retain a deep affection for Boris Johnson after he did precisely that. And, of course, we subsequently discovered that the, 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 the father of the... Uh, man that he put in the Lord's KGB spy, uh, Alexander Lebedev, currently sanctioned in uh, Canada and other countries as being part of Vladimir Putin's inner circle, was also in attendance as well. So you could reasonably say, James, it could be worse. A foreign secretary could ditch his security detail and go partying with a KGB spy after a Russian chemical attack on British soil. And some elements of the British media would be still cheerleading for Boris Johnson, for it was he, while professing to be deeply troubled by Keir Starmer's uh, attempt, desire, professed ambition to spend more time with his family on a Friday evening. It is 11.34. David is in Walthamstow. David, what do you reckon? Hi, James. Hello, I'm going to give you a, another Jewish opinion. Is that three and three? Three for three. We've got a hat trick. Three for three. I think I, I it's important you disagree with the previous two callers, just, to, just, for, just for consistency <laughs> well, and you know tone. Do you, absolutely. Well, do you know what? I will slightly, and I'll say that it is... A, it, <laughs> I'll say that it's this. I think it's a, it's a dog whistle is mm. what it is. And I think they know exactly, exactly what they're doing. Gosh. Right. Back in 2005, I remember, if you remember, there was a poster of Michael Howard 
yes. you know, just before the 2005 election. Uh, and it said, um, I can spend the same money twice. And it was him, like, rocking a, 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 a sort of chain, at, like trying to hypnotise people. And the Labour Party then, under Blair, were accused of being, you know, just pandering to prejudice and looking like it was Fagin. Yes. And the reality is, is that there are a lot of people in this country, I believe, who would be affected by that. There are a lot more, I think, that wouldn't be, who wouldn't care two hoots if they were Jewish or if their partner was Jewish. Yeah. But there are some, there is a rump, who would be, right, I'm not going to vote for that guy. So all they have to do is they have to say, oh, you know, we're not being anti-Semitic, but, the, the, you know, just the fact that the opposition, the wife member is Jewish mm. is enough, perhaps to get some people oh, to vote. Yeah. Please don't think I'm speaking about everyone listening. No, to I know program. that you're not. You're being you're being very cautious in your language and 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 very diplomatic. It's I'm not being cautious or diplomatic. I'm just being honest actually. First of all, you know, I, I think that you know, I think that Yeah, sorry. You're absolutely right. You, that's all right. Yeah, don't have to apologize. I mean, it's good uh, to apologize. Uh, it's not enough apology in this world. Hopefully some people okay. will apologize for their attacks on Keir Starmer today when they reflect upon what what it what it perhaps involves. I, well, I accept your apology. And if, <laughs> Vladimir, if, if Vladimir Putin was to invade Hendon, which is one hell of a thought at yes. 601, whilst Keir Starmer was tucking into chicken soup uh, with his family, I'm sure that would not be a problem for him. They took Labour took I mean, down that insane. image. I, I, I've just looked up the Michael Har- Har- Howard um, poster. Fagin or Shylock, actually, would both be sort of uh, anti-Semitic yeah. tropes, inextricably linked mm-hmm. to notions of centuries-old prejudice, the then editor of the Jewish Chronicle said. And they, they took it down a little later. I, I, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm going to it's be cautious. I'm going to cautiously disagree with you. For me, the story changes at the point we become aware of the Shabbat element of the of the story. I think prior to that, most people probably didn't know that Keir Starmer was was married to a Jewish woman. Or, 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 or... That, but that's that's my point. Forgive me. That, that, that is exactly my point. They're trying to raise the profile of that fact. That's so. I completely agree with you. But where we end up, I think, is slightly different. Yeah. I think what they're trying to do is let a certain type of you I know, hope not. Pretty unpleasant curtain twitcher yeah. who, who might reconsider their vote I based on the leader of the opposition's wife being half Jewish, I believe, because only her dad, I believe, was Jewish. I don't, I don't know the full ins and outs. I don't know. But that is. Well, she, ob- she, she observes Shabbat, so, you know, in terms of sure. religiously, sure. She, she, is, she is Jewish. I hope you're wrong. I really do hope you're wrong. And, and I don't know whether my, my hope that you're wrong informs my current conviction that you are right i don't think that well, people like grant shapps and greg hans have set out this morning to draw attention to the jewishness of of keir starmer's wife i think they're so blinded by their own bias that they have yeah. overlooked things of which they should have been more cognizant but i i don't want to believe right. that they've done it in a but kind look, of dog whistle way fair enough the last thing i'd say to you yes. and i think we could probably both agree is that it is just desperation 48 yes. hours yeah, and they've got they have got nothing this is this is what they've got to think that a man you know eating with his family <laughs> is a political line of attack yeah. is just sugar, as we would say <laughs> nicely done Eleven thirty-eight is the time and the question really has got almost as many answers as there are contributors to this hour of the program which is which is exactly how i like it for me the traditional attack upon Keir Starmer for saying anything. I disagree with David on the on the the salience of the story. It was an interview that was done yesterday. Chris Evans has been in touch asking if he gets a Ray Liotta for this. I don't, I don't think he gets it. Does he get a Ray Liotta? No, he does, definitely doesn't get a Ray Liotta. He doesn't, he doesn't get it. He's already had one, I think. Um, but um, he has, hasn't he, on Mystery So the, the, the conversation is newsworthy because it's happened in the last 24 hours. And, and picking up upon it, if he'd said we try and keep Wednesday evenings free, I think John Ingolders Green was right. It would have actually been treated the same in the first instance by Tory politicians and, and, and client journalists. But once the explanation is clear, and as I keep telling you, it's incredibly easy to find. Um, once the explanation for why he keeps Friday nights clear is, is known, to continue with the attacks then, I think does move into the territory described 
by David and, and, and by other callers, and indeed referenced by John Mann, the independent anti-Semitism advisor, who's used the word dangerous, using precisely that point, saying the attack on Keir Starmer for asserting his right to family time on a Friday night is so dangerous, and he crucially adds, so insidious from those aware of why he chooses to be with his family specifically on Friday evenings. That is the point for me at which it moves into a different dimension. On the other hand, there, there is always the fear that, that both sides could be indulging in dirty politics. Lord Mann might be an independent advisor to the, to the Conservative Prime Minister, but he's a Labour politician. I wouldn't accuse him personally of that, but it, it is helpful to the Labour Party to have the independent advisor on anti-Semitism essentially accusing the conservative establishment of having moved into uh, anti-Semitic territory. 20 to 12 is the time. Sarah is in Cardiff. Sarah, what would you like to say? Hi, first time caller, James. You're very welcome. Um, I just can't believe the complete levels of insanity that this criticism for Starmer is quite frankly getting. I, I, I'm the same. I, I think it's, you think you've seen it all, don't you? And then and then you you wake up on a Tuesday morning and it, it's a whole new yeah. level of madness. It's parody level Twitter accounts. Yes. It's not real politician Twitter accounts. And I've been reminded this morning on Twitter and I'm not going to, I can't take credit for it, but I won't say who posted it because you get heard of paranoia. Yes. But, you know, this talk about if Putin invaded... Oh, no, you can. You can do that. Greg Hands. Yeah, no, no, not that bit. Who oh. tweeted what I'm about to say. Oh, OK, then. But I've just been reminded that it was not that long ago when the Afghanistan situation escalated, that Rob was on holiday and initially <laughs> refused to come home to deal with it. <laughs> no, think, that's not fair. The sea was closed. Well, that's what I was about to say. <laughs> I think that was his excuse about how he, cut, he was acting absolutely working because the sea was closed so he couldn't have been on the beach and the same person who I won't mention also yes. pointed out that we've had at least two politicians who whilst they are politicians have gone off into the jungle program mm. not prime well, minister not serving been... prime ministers but but yeah the double standards yeah. are a little bit extraordinary I, I think the best story is probably David Cameron talking about having a weekly yeah. date night with his wife in 2012 and prompting precisely no accusations of inviting Vladimir Putin to invade Hendon. Absolutely. And I think, you know, everybody deserves family time. I don't care what party they're from. And the suggestion by some people that he would just simply not take calls and it was an, in the... <laughs> <national> <laughs> <business> <laughs> Could you imagine? What are you doing here? We're all, they're all waiting outside. What, what's, what's wrong? Vladimir Putin's just invaded Cardiff. Where's the Prime Minister? Oh, he's just having pudding. We're going to have to wait until tomorrow morning. I mean, what is Greg hands on when he sits there with his little phone and thinks, oh, I've got a good one. Here's a zinger. I don't think that there is anti-Semitism in some of these attacks, but I think the point at which it is established that that is a reason for his behaviour on Friday evenings is the point at which you go, ah, I think we'll, we'll just back off now. We'll leave it now. To double, triple, quadruple down on it is when it becomes comes dangerous. I think they've just got really excited that they think they found um, yeah. a gotcha, I've caught you out moment, yes. and they just can't see quite how insane they are. And it's a suggestion that anybody who is Prime Minister or a Minister or anybody for that matter in this country should be working 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Like, it's, I know. And well, you say that. You, I, I, I think it was Maria Caulfield today claiming she works 20 hours a day. Um, she also embarrassed herself on, on Sky News. We'll have a listen to that now. But first, a clarification. John Mann sits as a crossbencher. He left the Labour Party due to anti-Semitism under Jeremy Corbyn, of course. So, it, or, albeit that he is a Labour politician of old. It was probably wrong of me to refer to him as such in the context of his of his current role. Quarter to 12 is the time. Sarah, thank you. It is the thin line sometimes between being ridiculous and being dangerous. I, I think this story has crossed it in the course of this morning. But, I, I mean, this was more ridiculous than dangerous. This is Maria Caulfield being interviewed by Matt Barbette, who does a bang-up job here on, on Sky News. But listen to how casually she lies. So I don't think there's anything anti-Semitic about this element of the of the story and its coverage this morning but listen to how comfortably and how cravenly 
Maria Caulfield blatantly and knowingly lies about this Keir Starmer story. Two days to go until uh, polling opens. I'm joined by Conservative candidate and Health Minister Maria Caulfield, who's in Lewis in East Sussex. Good morning to you. Good morning. How important to you is work-life balance? It is pretty important, but I would say as a, a minister, um, it's it's uh, not really that that feasible. Uh, I note that uh, probably what you're alluding to is Keir Starmer saying he's going to be doing a four day week and, and finishing at six no, o'clock no, 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 every no, no, no. evening. No, he didn't say a four day week. He said he was going to finish work at six on a Friday, like many people do. And I believe that's to help his wife observe her uh, Jewish faith, which is commonplace amongst Jewish people. So not a four day week. That's not true. Well, Amazing how casually she just lied like that. So it suddenly goes from trying to keep Friday evenings free for dinner to a four-day week. And to think we spent the first hour wondering why this campaign had gone so badly for them all. It is 12 to 12. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um, Alex Tate is in the studio. Alex, you may remember, is a co-founder of Reform Political Advertising. And the man responsible, really, for, for my penny drop moment when it, it, it was explained to me that there are more regulations governing the advertising of, for example, washing powder or crisps than there are political advertising. Um, uh, and you've been on a bit of a quest, Alex, but um, a fruitful one, I think it's fair to say. Last time I heard your voice, you were on the phone to Sadiq Khan asking him before the last mayoral election if he would sign up to your... Um, uh, your project, your pledge. You did hear back from him, I think. That's right, yeah, he signed up to it. And Neil Kinnock recently, uh, former Labour leader, has come out and said that the work you do is important and fully supported by him. That's right, yeah. Yeah, we had, um, no, thanks for all your help around that. We had uh, six uh, London mayor candidates that supported it, including the, the Lib Dems and Greens as well. Um, Which one didn't? Uh, we didn't hear back from Susan Hall, but we tried. Maybe someone had pinched the uh, the letter that you sent her. <laughs> her pocket had been picked once again. Let's look at some of the adverts that you've picked up on this campaign. And, and I should say, before anyone starts panicking, that there are four, you've, you, we've got examples from four parties in front of us. Just just run through the kind of thing that you want to bring an end to. Yeah, and I think it's I think it's worth. It is just. We just think it is ridiculous that there aren't any, there isn't any regulation for misleading this in advertising. Um, and you, you mentioned about washing powder having various rules you've got to abide by. Um, but it isn't washing powder. Um, for election ads, it's the most important form of advertising, obviously. Um, and we think actually, I'll talk through these examples, but mm. we think this election period has been probably the worst we've seen actually over the last couple of years. Um, there's a low cost to entry. Uh, the spending limits have gone up, and of course there are no rules to constrain them. Um, and we've seen examples across the parties. So um, I could start off with um, a, probably a well-known one to your mm. uh, listeners. Uh, the Conservatives um, have obviously had as a theme of their campaign uh, Labour's tax rise and a claim around uh, £2,000 uh, tax increase. Um, the, the consensus has been, and our friends at Full Fact have as sort of agree with us that it's just not clear that that's over multiple years as opposed to a one year period um, but that's been quite a central theme so you think period. deliberately designed to make people think it's two grand every year that's right yeah that's right yeah and actually i got a i got a a leaflet through my letterbox uh, that presumably is going around a, a lot of london and perhaps other parts of the uk um from the conservatives uh mentioning that Sadiq khan's going to introduce a na nationwide ULES zone uh, which is starmer uh, sorry, yeah, yeah. Kistama, which uh, doesn't have any um, basis in, 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 in fact. I think there's been some discussion around uh, clean air zones in some mm. strategy paper, but there's no, no basis to that. But it's not just the Conservatives. We've seen it across different parties. Um, you know, Labour actually have got an ad that's had quite a bit of commentary as well. Um, so they had a claim that um, over the course of the next parliament, um, your mortgage could go up £4,800. Uh, and it doesn't have any substantiation on it and actually... Uh, a lot of the consensus around that is that um, it, it's it's based on a lot of assumptions mm. um, and not very robust and not substantiated. And, and then, of course, I suppose if you it, just to to make it quite even handed across the parties, um, there's one I sent you, actually, and I can put it on our Twitter feed later. If people want to have a look at it. Um, there's Liberal Democrats have obviously got a uh, quite a history. They've taken a bit of a different angle uh, this campaign with a lot of the stunts they've been doing. <laughs> <laughs> we may do that in the next hour of the programme, whether or not Ed Davies 
sort of tribute act to It's a Knockout. It's as if he's doing a different round of It's a Knockout every day. Is is successful or, or unsuccessful politics? But you're right. They've certainly been doing things differently, although not perhaps in the arena of advertising. But there's, there's still still a lot of the bar charts that have been quite a yeah. historic staple. They've been quite well known for, and. Um, a lot of misleading bar charts from several parties, but um, one I sent you that just literally, I think, was, according to the Facebook ad library, served across the UK and didn't have um, any labelling on it at all. Had it just below the, the had, had just had them just below the. the Who can win in your area? That one making it look like the Liberal Democrats were the closest. That's right. Without yeah. any constituency specific detail or anything at all. Yeah, just one. And just one example of numerous um, ones we found. Yes. Uh, and, and reform um, uh, being economical with the truth about immigration. Yes. So there's a, our future is at stake with the, 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 the title goes and mm. our future is at stake with 40 million new arrivals in 12 years, um, which is a, yeah, is an incorrect use of the ONS data. Um, conscious or unconscious, I suppose we'd have to wait for someone to ask. Well, if you ask Mr. Farage, you'd claim it had nothing to do with him, I presume. Um, give me an idea of what the glorious future looks like under your glorious rule. Well, so we've we've done we've done um, we've been on a bit of a journey. Yes. I think of dismantling the arguments against regulation. So you talked about the code, uh, and this code that we launched on your show actually mm. earlier in the year around the mayoral elections was to get people to sign up and commit uh, to um, to 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 be accurate in their election ads, um, and. Uh, Whilst we've got a lot of momentum around that, we wanted to also show how it's practical yes. and actually how you could deploy that and use it in an election period. So we've set up an election ad review panel. Uh, we piloted this concept in 2022 to demonstrate, actually, uh, the election advertising can be regulated in a UK election. Uh, it's we don't. There aren't really when you go through all of this. There aren't really arguments against regulation. One of the things we of fact-based claims. One of the things we hear sometimes is, could it work in a in a general election? Yeah. Isn't it too fast-paced? How would that possibly work? So we tried to put that to bed by um, by this panel. It's been uh, chaired by David Putnam, who, mm. um, when he was in the House of Lords, uh, actually chaired the Democracy and Digital Technology mm -hmm. Committee that recommended electoral ad regulation that we give evidence to. Uh, and we've had seven people from inside and outside the ad industry showing how it can practically work. So we're, we're we've we've got we're sourcing ads uh, that are potentially misleading, evidence it, and then actually in a very quick turnaround time, um, up to 24 hours, um, we get a judgment back from the panel on if it's misleading or not. And we're not pretending to be a regulator. No. Um, we're just showing... It could almost be advisors, I suppose. So if I'm leader of a major political party, I, I get to decide whether or not to sign up to this. And the more members of the public are aware of it, the more pressure is uh, exerted upon the political leaders, party leaders, party machines to sign up because the alternative would be why don't you want to sign up to something that just requires you to tell basic truths well the next step is obviously yeah like it, we've demonstrated that it can work and it's not just us in the uk there's other well, the mayoral election other. has become a, a, a fairly important sort of advert for you in a way hasn't it, it? In what sense? Well, in, 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 the, the, that it is possible for senior politicians to sign up to this and to abide by the code yeah yeah absolutely yeah yeah exactly it's shown it to be very very practical um and actually, we've done. Um, we've also done actually last week some research with Opinion hmm. uh, that shows. I think, like, if you're a politician, it's just common sense. It's just an intelligent thing to do. So we've always, I think, um, made the argument. I suppose that it's good for voters. Okay, and our research this time round again shows hmm. seventy six of the UK population, seventy six percent of the UK population um, would agree that uh, electoral ads should be factually accurate. Only four percent would oppose. <laughs> I'd love it. to meet the people who don't. Well, it's only four percent, <laughs> is it? Is that you've got some don't knows as yeah. well in the mix as exactly. well? Exactly. Four percent don't want factually accurate electoral ads. So they say in the survey. Yeah. Uh, and but sixty-eight percent to give you a couple more stats. Sixty-eight percent um, either don't know that it's regulated or think that it is regulated. Uh, yes, of course. I did. I think I just presumed it was until until someone explained to me. I, I think before you did just how bad it was. But but you you, you crystallised it. Speaking of you, Alex Tate. Just remind us why you took on this mission, why you chose to start and continue this fight. Uh, just because it's ridiculous. <laughs> it's, it's, just, it's just ridiculous. Yeah, we're from an advertising and marketing background, uh, and there's no reason why this should uh, not happen. Um, we've got to a point, really, as I was saying, kind of by kind of 
trying to dismantle all the arguments mm. against it and showing how practical it is um, that it can work. But it's really, um, you know, it distorts democracy. It sw- we think we've got examples of it swinging local elections um, and you know, obviously distorts sort of national elections too. Uh, and and someone's got to do it. Actually, to be honest, like, there weren't too many people putting up their hands to to take so it. It's forward. an act of public service. You probably think that's I, pompous, or you think you I don't sound want to sound pompous. No, well, you don't. I'm, I'm calling think, it an act of public service. But, it, I, but I think, motivated by principle. I think so. I think well, there's a very small group of us yes. involved in this, and uh, we're all passionately driven. Really, um, we're all you know we rely on unpaid volunteers um, and operate really on a, a shoestring sure. budget. Um, but everyone's yeah, just 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 so, determined ha- to show how it can work and 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 making progress, which isn't always the case with with campaigns born of of, of principle and integrity. How can people find out more about what you do and possibly even get involved and have a proper look at the code as yeah. well? Yeah, so we're doing so if you if they follow uh, Clear Politics on Twitter or X, Clear Politics with a five is the last S. That's our Twitter handle. So it's Clear Politics with a five is the last S. Um, we're going to be um, publishing. Um, our review and the findings of the panel um, over the next few days in the run-up to the election. And if um, the next phase, really, for our campaign is looking at resourcing it properly, to Mm. be honest. So if people go onto our website, reformpoliticaladvertising.org, and they want to support us, if anyone wants to donate to our our, our, um, rather um, cash-strapped cause, Mm. um, we're keen to to sort of move it up a gear. Now, we've proved that it can all work. We've proved that... um, you know, it's got a lot of support politically. Um, we just need to ensure that we're, yeah, sort of engaging with the right um, stakeholders and and trying well, that to was that's that. my final question is is what what because no, I, unfortunately I can't arrange a phone in with every political leader and and get you on to put put it to them. Although we could probably help a little bit moving forward. What kind of responses have you had from parties at national level so far? We've had. Um, we've had some very positive yeah uh, because if one goes they might all go yeah yeah because otherwise it becomes a campaigning tool we've signed up to a pledge not to fib in off adverts why haven't you (laughs) yes yes quite 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 yeah so you're optimistic by the time of the next general election will will your work be done uh, it's not a yeah it's not like a this hasn't been a short project no clearly um but we are we're determined to, to take it on to the next level. The momentum, actually, you've been incredibly helpful, actually, I've got to say, this year, uh, at giving Good. some oxygen to this whole well, campaign it as well. It. It's not just um, me, it's my listeners as well. I mean, how yeah. can anybody be against... Well, apart from that mysterious 4%, how can <laughs> anybody be against the idea of making political parties tell the truth in yeah, their adverts? Yeah, yeah, it feels like we're at a point and we're at a junction where when, ev- when all these parties are talking about needing to clean up politics. It's yes. like a central agenda and central plank. Well, you're handing um, them a broom, Alex Tate. Indeed. You? They're indeed. making all the speeches about the importance of cleaning up politics and up pops reform political advertising to hand them a dustpan and brush. And part of, and part of our research also showed um, that uh, we compared like, how much you trust ads across mm. different sectors. And, of course, election ads are the least trusted. Yes. Um, as that disconnect... That's bad for all of us. The disconnect, bad for democracy. Well, the disconnect between politician and the voter because of distrust yes. is just a key thing that obviously politicians are keen on addressing. And this is just part of the long, low-hanging fruit, really, to try to um, to take some solid actions, at trying to take some steps to, to rebuild it. I think it was 56% of people in our research said their trust ads more... Um, if it was regulated by someone like the ASA, um, which is a sort of positive, rather than it being something that is only important to voters, this should be important to politicians as well. Indeed it should. Um, Carry on, more power to your elbow. Um, Reformpoliticaladvertising.org is the website, and as Alex mentioned, Clear Politics is the... Twitter address where the final S is actually the figure five. So clear politic five, if you prefer. I will retweet something from that account shortly so that it's easy for you to find if you you follow me. Alex Tate, co-founder of Reform Political Advertising. Always good to see you. It's 12.01. It's four minutes after 12. I like that guy. I like Alex Tate. I I, I first came across him because he wanted to avail himself of of, of the platform to put it forward. And I get requests like that quite a lot. But there's something about this one. Just, Just... come across people who are just doing something for no personal gain whatsoever, but because they think it would be in the national interest. They think it would be for the public good. Um, I, I do, do find out more, if you want, about reform political advertising. Um, it happened again, did you notice, in the news bulletin? Uh, it, it, it's actually surreal. So you've got, I mean, almost every day you've got uh, Labour making a policy announcement, Tories launching a dirty trick, 
uh, reform either losing a candidate uh, or, or, or having to get rid of one. Um, and then, then the last line will be, and Ed Davey has milked a giraffe or something like that. On, on this occasion, Ed Davey has knocked over a huge set of, of blue dominoes. So when it started, and I can't remember what the first stunt was, the paddleboard was the first one. Was well, let's like that. So do you remember? So when this when this happened? You told me that audio worked. It's not, I thought there'd be a splashing noise or something like that. Are we not. Can we add a splashing noise to that, Keith? Can we get a splashing noise? Can we get a splashing noise for that? So that's Kit. That's what's his chops. Ed Davy falling off a paddleboard on several occasions, but crucially, having the time of his life. Did you know that I am not the only LBC presenter to have made it onto John Oliver's Tonight Show in America in in recent weeks? In fact, Charlotte Lynch's interview with Ed Davy on a teacups ride at the fair. Uh, got got considerably more space than the little nod towards my book. I don't know whether you you heard it at the time. Mental health, well-being of our kids is really important. What about the economy? What are you doing on the economy? Yeah, we've got to get it growing again, and that that will uh, that'll be helped by cutting the NHS waiting list, also by getting a much better trade deal with Europe, and by investing in the skills of our young people. So you know we've got great policies for the economy, including the cost of living. <laughs> I can always pick a favourite, but we've only just started clipping up the clip, so we might not have any more. We've got one from yesterday, though. I, I thought this was my favourite until I got reminded of the teacups one. Um, can you work out, if you haven't heard this before and you weren't listening to the show yesterday, would you like to have a guess at what of what Ed Davey is doing here? <laughs> So, it's infectious, right? Is it, is it infectious? I'm infected. I, so, you've got the, the, the paddleboard event, the bungee jump event, the teacups. The, the, I've got absolutely no idea what question I'm going to ask you, by the way, at the end of this introduction. So, you know, I, your guess is as good as mine, frankly, at this point. But it's going to be something to do. Oh, hang on. Then, of course, I've got to put that one down. I might just sit here and play clip roulette. In fact, speaking of clips, Keith, we we missed Smear Keir. The whole of this morning is Smear Keir. It's like the mother of... Can we get Smear Keir ready? In fact, just play me a Smear Keir at some point in order to just um, uh, double-check on the last hour of the programme. So that is today's news. Smear Keir. That's my favourite one out of all of the ones we've ever done. And do you know why it's so good? What? Should we do the long version? Should we do the long version of it? Yeah, go on. And if you are catching up on this later on YouTube, you'll have just seen me dancing, which is a little treat for you. Don't forget to subscribe and ring that bell for regular updates. It's doing really well, the YouTube thing. Why on earth do you want to see me? You want to see my ugly mug while I'm doing this? Every, it's beyond me. I, and there's nothing else in here except my enormous mug, which has become a celebrity in its own right on social media. Not just social media. It popped up on television in Australia last month, my, my mug. Um, here's Ed Davey drumming in a care home while sitting on an exercise ball in Hampshire. I still have no idea what question I'm going to ask you, but there are four examples of Ed Davey, the Liberal Democrat leader, um, campaigning over the last few weeks. Another element of what I think we can fairly describe as a very personality-driven campaign, another element is him speaking about the challenges of caring for his profoundly disabled son. And that, that 
cuts to the quick. Uh, uh, he's spoken to me about this on full disclosure and the uncertainty about what will happen to their son when they are no longer here to look after him is a constant companion of of Mr. and Mrs. Davy. And, and that spoke to a humanity that is rare in politicians. I think they have humanity, don't, don't get me wrong, but I think they're so cautious about displaying it. I just look at this morning what happens when Keir Starmer reveals he likes to have dinner with his family on Fridays. Uh, the, the, the patheticness of much of our media has, has rendered political discourse a, a, a curious combination of anodyne and scandalous. And so for Ed Davey to decide that that was an important enough issue to... Um, an important enough issue to go public with was, was I, I thought, very powerful. So what do we think about Ed Davies' campaign? I said, That's really all I want to ask you. Because when Boris Johnson did these things, some people liked it. He didn't, quite, he didn't do it in quite the same way, did he? But he did, I think, fall into the water. Is it just another version of Johnsonism, or, or is it more endearing, less endearing? It's, it's essentially, when I ask you what you can remember about the Liberal Democrats' general election campaign, you will say... Uh, uh, well, one of the above. Oh, the teacups, the bungee jump, the paddleboard, the drumming. Or wasn't there a massive... Um, didn't he do a massive water slide at one point as well? So I, I, I really like it. I, I, I cannot, however, say that it is likely to influence my vote in it. I don't think it's going to influence my vote in any way. Um, so I think we should listen to the, to, to the serious bit as well because he was talking to, to Beth Rigby over at Sky. I got sent a bunch of freebies by Sky yesterday for election night, including Eleanor took this home. Have you drunk it yet? A bottle of Beth Rigg beer. That's good marketing by Sky. They, they sent me a bottle of beer, which they branded up to call it Beth Rigg beer. They also sent me some Adidas Sambas, would you believe? But one's got red stripes on it and one's got blue stripes on it. I'm doing a gig on election night, so I shall wear those. That'll be hilarious. But obviously, I don't know if I'll ever be able to wear them again because they've got, they've got non-matching stripes on them. I think they sent Ferrari a pair. If he's got the same size shoes as me, we might be able to swap one out and, and he can have the blue pair and I'll have the red pair. That would be nice. Um, here is Ed Davies speaking to Beth Rigby at Sky News about caring for John, um, his 16-year-old son. It was a young carer. We had our first child, John, and um, we realised uh, after about a year that he was going to be uh, severely disabled. His wife, Emily, who recently revealed she has multiple sclerosis, also cares for John. The thing about being a carer is it's absolutely exhausting. It's physically exhausting, it's emotionally exhausting. For John, he's now 16, what do you hope for his future? The first thing is to enable him to be as independent as he possibly can be and be the wonderful uh, boy and man that he can be. I think any parent would say this, no one's going to care for him like we do. I mean, there'll be some wonderful carers out there, I'm sure, who, who look after their, uh, their patients um, very much, but um, no one's going to hold him like we hold him. That's why it's easier just to focus on the immediate, isn't it? And the practical. And you can have all sorts of illegal ideas. I'm also solicited. I have trusts and all of that, but actually, it's what you've got to have as a caring community, a caring society, and that's our best. That's the best hope for the future. It is 13 minutes after 12. Um, I, I, it's an extraordinary event or, or, or moment in, in UK politics for a senior politician, a party leader who conceivably could be leader of Her Majesty's opposition by the end of the week, to have somehow bridged the profundity of that personal experience and the hilarity of, of his election campaign. The, the numbers haven't moved much in the polls. I, I, I'm eternally fascinated by the role that the Liberal Democrats play in British politics. We are, of course, in a, in a period of purder at the moment, so I have to be a little bit careful about where we go. But um, but I, I just want, I genuinely just want you to tell me what that has done to you what 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 the the, the fun and frolics not not the well you could talk about anything um jack's crying his eyes out while delivering the post this morning so if you i don't know where he's working i don't know where jack is but um if you're if you if you're if you're 
morning mail looks a little bit tear stained. That that's my fault, um, or, or or Red Davies, however you want to cut it. But I, I just I just want to have a conversation about the behaviour of Ed Davey during this election campaign because I, I, I feel that it is something that we should talk about. And yet I haven't got a more sophisticated question for you. Is there a downside to it? Does it, does it undermine the seriousness of the job in hand or of the task ahead of him? I, I don't think I've enjoyed a politician's behaviour as much as I've enjoyed Ed Davey's in my life. And for the record, I, I became a fairly um, uh, caustic critic of Boris Johnson. Um, but when he was mayor of London, I enjoyed I enjoyed his stunts as well. I, I, I think most obviously it was when he got stuck on a zip wire, wasn't it? Uh, I think I enjoyed it. I can't remember, to be honest with you. But certainly in retrospect, I, I don't look back on that askance. It, it's what he did in proper power that um, represents his legacy. So let's do both. Let's talk about the, 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 the serious side of it as represented by his comments about his son. But I guess I want a, a sort of, it's Tuesday today, the election's on Thursday. We can't talk about politics on Thursday. So we're going to be doing end of term reports, I suspect, tomorrow or looking back at re retrospectives of what has brought us to this point, as well as a little glance at what the... Um, at what the what, what what the future might hold, but I, I just I just want I just I just don't know what to make of it. On the one hand, I love it, right? It's it's hilarious and charming and utterly delightful. Mm. On the other hand, there's a little bit of me that's just wondering whether or not it has served any purpose whatsoever. So that's the question. What do you make of it, Ed Davies' unique election campaign? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three, and crucially, crucially. Has it worked? Has it worked? And remember, you can answer no to that question, although I think, as I find it also charming, I'm kind of hoping that you're going to answer yes. It's 19 minutes after 12. Has, has it worked? And, and what, what has it done to you? I've got some lovely uh, um, text coming in, uh, really lovely, actually, which suggests that it, that it has worked. This is absolutely, I think, what Ed Davey is dreaming of. This is from Will, who writes, In 2010, after my first year at university, I cast my first vote for the Liberal Democrats. After their betrayal on tuition fees, I vowed I'd never vote for them again. Sir Ed Davey has changed my mind. Declan writes, He comes across as more genuine and human, which is refreshing in a campaign of very clinical and calculated politicians. Um, however, I should note that it will have no influence whatsoever on my vote. That is the point of my question, really. Um, Thomas takes up a similar theme. If I didn't need to vote tactically in my constituency, then I would vote Liberal Democrat in a heartbeat. A decent set of policies being campaigned for by what appears to be a truly decent human being. He's not a robot in a suit. He's just a good bloke doing ridiculous things, and it's incredibly heartwarming and breaks down the barriers of faceless politicians. Nicola and Finchley, Ed Davey is what politics and politicians could be without a corrupt and cynical media. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, I, I, I'm not, I, I think much of the media is indeed corrupt and cynical, but I don't know that you want your senior politicians spending their lives doing bungee jumps and, and, and fairground rides to the exclusion of almost all, all else, um, except, of course, that incredibly powerful commentary about his son, John. Um, and perhaps, says Richard, your question should be about why, in spite of leading a campaign like this, Ed Davey has received substantially and disproportionately less attention from the media than Nigel Farage. <sighs> well, I mean, he's received quite a lot of attention, but don't forget that the uh, um, a lot of the coverage that Nigel Farage is receiving is because candidates keep defecting or doing disgusting things. So it's it's a bit of a mixed bag, that, Richard, isn't it? It's a bit of a poison chalice. And, of course, it is doing these things that guarantees the level of coverage that, that, um, that Ed Davey receives. So, I mean, today's news regarding uh, Reform UK Limited candidates is is pretty much of a piece with what has gone before. One of them branded King Charles a climate cracker, said the late Queen was an OAP on state benefits and that they would prefer murderers Fred and Rose West to the royal family. Um, uh, there's a, a selection of them in, in today's media um, attacking the royal family and, and comparing the monarchy to... Fred and Rose West, but uh, but 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 I don't know. Is that the kind of coverage you'd actually want? Let's go to Ben, who's in Alicante. Ben, Ed Davy, what do you reckon? 
Um, I'm really liking him, and I'm liking him in part because of what you just said about reform. If reform are the kind of photographic negative, then he's the photographic positive. Mm. I think reform perpetually... Do you mean yin and yang? ...moan and gripe. Yes. And, yes, they, they're, they're always moaning, and they're presenting such a negative view of the country. And there he is, and he's presenting a kind of positive view. And then when you hear about his personal experience, which I actually think ties in really well with, 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 with his antics... I think he looks like a guy that, 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 that I mean, if I hadn't voted already on my postal vote, I, 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 um, I probably would have voted for him. He, 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 and I think he would make an excellent leader of the opposition in no small part because I think he would genuinely oppose in terms of the EU, the single market, the customs union, where I don't think um, the Conservatives would because they don't, they don't go anywhere near Brexit. Mm. And I think that would be one of his most important jobs. Yeah. So I'm really enjoying this. And, and this is a new development guy. for you. you. You've arrived at a different place from uh, uh, where you were previously. Well, I voted, I voted for, for, for... Can I say... No, no, no you better not. I don't know. How, how do postal votes work? Where does that get counted for a constituency that you're registered in, back at home, back in the UK? Yes, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, yeah, no, I yeah. didn't know that. No, don't tell me anything about anything. It's, honestly, okay. I, just get, I just get all paranoid. Okay, I have to apologise. But, but yeah. no, no, you didn't say it. There's nothing to apologise for. So, so, so it's just worked. He's somehow connected with you on a human level, and that has translated into a political... Shift, it, it, both as it in were. terms of the stunts and in terms of yeah. what, what him and his wife spoke about, I just found that incredibly moving. And I think that the two are one of a piece. He, yeah. he strikes me as being a person that can find goodness and optimism. It's authenticity. In, authenticity. Uh, pure yeah, authenticity. authenticity to him. And he doesn't remind me remotely of, of Johnson, who I felt faked it all. Yeah, OK. Well, I mean, you've answered every element of my question. I'm grateful for it. 24 minutes after 12 is the timer. I, I don't know whether or not it's going to nudge any needles politically, but it's nudged ben, Ben's a bit. It's, it's something very nice about it. Something very human, very authentic. But um, but whether or not that is what you want from your politics is is a, a question I suppose we're going to get an answer to on Thursday. Phil's in Harpenden. Phil, what would you like to say? James, Hello, mate. Um, I, I, I followed sort of Ed Davies' um, stunt through the campaign, and I, I would have been, to be honest, you know, m more of the Brexit stuff a, a Lib Dem voter, mm. but it, it, to be honest, it's the lack of seriousness <laughs> and the lack of kind of focus on policy. All I know about Lib, you know, Ed Davy from the media really is, uh, you know, each day it's sort of a little uh, adventure tour he's gone on. Yes. But it, it's detracted for me from the policies. And I was quite surprised, actually. Mm. I, I looked at the Lib Dem manifesto and thought, blimey, th this, this isn't what I thought, you know, the Lib Dem, where the Lib Dems would be on some issues. Now, I know they move around a lot, but for me, it's, it's just kind of distracted from that. And it's, it's a bit more of that kind of, you know, bit of the media circus. And then I think, well... Hold on, he, he, as you said, he, he could be the leader of the opposition soon. And I don't think people really would know what they're what they voted for. Mm, so, right, but well, right, apart from the Brexit stuff, uh, the, 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 then you, you, you kind of, you take your politics more seriously than the average Joe, perhaps, Phil. I don't know. I, 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 well, I, I mean, yeah, I don't well, mean that as a, as a criticism or anything like that. Well, uh, well, I, I think, look, it's the first time in my life, and I live in a con constituency which has been strongly Tory and will will. Probably yeah, don't tell me, don't say game. anything else. Don't say anything else. Yeah. A full list of candidates is available <laughs> yeah. at lbc.co.uk slash candidates. Um, but, but, but look, so, so I really felt I have a choice this time about, you know, where my vote goes, what's it supporting, you know, what, what do I believe in? It really, really made me think. And, That's yeah, interesting. I don't know, I, it, 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 it disappointed me because I get that he, he says, well, it's getting his attention and we wouldn't get it another way, but it's not. You know, it, to me, it's a serious business. I, well, not, I think um, I think he's done something. I mean, listen, your position is your position. I can't argue out of it or challenge it. It makes perfect sense, everything you've said. But if we were to, to track back and try and work out why they've elected to go down this road, it puts him in a, a, the polar opposite position from, was it Joe Swinson who led them into the last election and, yeah, and, and lost yeah, her own yeah. seat in the process? But she talked, apparently with a straight face, about her, her conviction that she was going to become prime minister. At yeah, one point, and, the and, coming through the yeah. door. So he's yeah. gone the opposite way to that. He's it certainly hasn't campaigned as if he's likely to be the next incumbent of Number Ten Downing Street. So he's sort of made a bid for our attention. He's made a bid for the nation's attempt a, 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 attention, and he's not going to get that with with a with a with a policy platform because people don't believe he's going to be prime minister. Yeah. So he's done something arguably very clever by by 
sticking a flag in the national consciousness that was not previously there. Yeah, and, and look, may, maybe it's a bit of Goldilocks because I think you know there's too much seriousness, there's too little. I think you know it, it, for me, I guess if if he if he kind of said, look. I'm starting off with these stunts, but now as we get into the end game of this campaign, and as look, we're, we're, we're yeah. going to, you know, everyone goes to the polls. Jokes aside, here's what I want to, you know, here's yeah. What I'm well, about. okay, and, and so, engage with my policies. Yeah, I, I think I, I, I could agree with that, but Jerry doesn't. Jerry says the exact opposite. While you, you've been talking, he sent me this. All the other politicians are droning on about what they're going to do and how they're going to spend the money. I believe all of those promises from the main parties will evaporate once in government. Ed Davey has grabbed my attention and made me look at his policies and manifesto. Water quality, housing and health are topics close to my heart. So there. Ha ha! <laughs> That, that it cuts both ways, doesn't it? I guess if you you know if you knew a lot about them in advance, you might be a little bit put off by the by the fun and frolics. But if you didn't know much about them in advance, you go, oh, this guy's interesting, the bungee jump guy. Let's go and um, let's go and check out what he stands for. Matt says he's going fully YOLO, which I believe stands for you only live once, doesn't it? He's going fully YOLO, living his best life. That's my youth correspondent, I think. Thank you, Phil. Um, your thoughts on, on what this Ed Davey campaign has done, what it has represented. I think I think the favourite, I mean, you can vote for your favourite on this one, but it's it's got to be the teacups, hasn't it? Not least because the inimitable Charlotte Lynch is I- I- intrinsic to the clip as well. Mental health well-being of our kids is really important! What about the economy? What are you doing on the economy? Yeah, we've got to get it growing again, and that, that will uh, ha- that'll be helped by cutting the NHS waiting list, also by getting a much better trade deal with Europe, and by investing in the skills of our young people. So, you know, we've got great policies for the economy, including the cost of living! I, I mean, fair play. So I haven't caught up with Charlotte about that experience, but I, as I've got older... I don't enjoy fairground rides like I used to. I've also developed a, 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 a kind of, um, not necessarily an irrational fear, because there are occasional stories, aren't they? But I, I, I worry about getting stuck, like at the top of a roller coaster or something. I never used to do that as a kid. I loved roller coasters. The Cobra at West Midland Safari Park. Uh, there was one summer where I had a fair crack of having been on it more than anybody else. But um, but these days I don't I don't it makes just makes even listening to that makes my tummy turn over. But that's got absolutely nothing to do with the conversation that we're having. Our earlier caller Ben, of course, and Alicante uh, touched upon. Uh, he's doing a Zumba class in Berkshire. I, I believe. When was that? It was that yesterday. So that was after the bungee jump. So on the same day, he did a bungee jump and then did a Zumba class. I, what it is, I think the phrase, the, and we've got, oh, crikey, there's, he's doing one of those things where you're dragged behind a boat and an enormous tyre. There's no way we've managed to keep, is, is it called, don't call me a donut. Uh, it, uh, there's no way you can keep up with all of these antics and, and, and adventures. It's extraordinary. But what do you make of it? 03456060973. Sorry. I was about to tell you that Ben mentioned his postal vote, Henry, Riley, and, and some of our colleagues here at LBC have been working on a, uh, a quite important story about the state of postal voting. He'll be joining us before one o'clock today, but the time now is half past 12 and Amelia Cox is here with your headlines. All right, we need a bit of a team meeting here because we're having a bit of a disagreement. I think it's really funny when I say to you, I'm going to read you two headlines. I want you to decide which one's true and which one's false. And we all know that they're all true. I think it's really funny. I think it's become a, a, a much loved feature of the show. But the producer thinks that we should be, and I'll use her words here, more sophisticated. Um, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know that I can be more sophisticated than, than, than. No, I don't think I can. I think it's really funny when I say, "Here are ten headlines. Can you guess which one isn't true?" And then at the end, I say, "They're all true." But I wonder whether the joke wears thin every single time I do it. So possibly for the last time, we're going to do two unhinged headlines, and I want you to decide which one is true. And which one is false? So it's time for... Unhinged Headline. Rhys Mogg tells young Tories he wants to build a wall in the English Channel. Or... Break, this is by John Redwood. Perhaps. <laughs> Allegedly. Brexit has been a great success. Don't let Labour kill it. Now, which of those do you think... Is true. Unhinged headline. Guess what? Go on, guess. Yeah, both of them. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. That's that. So, what do you reckon? Should we carry on with this much loved feature? 
of the programme or should we try to be more sophisticated? Send your vote to 84850 or WhatsApp me on 0345 606973. It's almost as if the spirit of Ed Davey is infecting us all this morning. What will I be doing next? Milking a giraffe, possibly. What's he going to do tomorrow? How's he going to end this? What's the climax of his campaign going to be? given all of the things that he's done already. I mean, just off the top of my head, we've got the teacups, the bungee jump, the paddleboard, the drumming, the donut, the, the zumba. I, I, I mean, we must be able to get it up to double figures. What else? The, the water slide, the water slide. This is a bit like um, the generation game when you're trying to guess, you're trying to remember what's gone past on the conveyor belt. Do you remember that? D aerobic, water aerobics, water aerobics, zumba, teacups, bungee jump, paddleboard, drumming, teas made. Tease made, cuddly toy. Uh, 12.36, back to Ed Davey. Alice is in Bista. Alice, what made you pick up the phone? Hi, James. Hello, um, thanks, thanks for taking the call. Oh, um, very been a long time listener, uh, first time caller, so Thank I'm a little you. nervous. Bear Thank with you. me. Oh, well. um, I think I found Ed Davey incredibly inspiring, actually. Oh. Um, I have a son who has a very simple, similar um, disability profile to um, Ed Davey's son. He has complex learning disabilities, autism, and um, a variety of health complaints. And I think, for me, seeing somebody in the public eye who lives a very similar life yes. to the one that I do, who has whose child has a very similar future to the one my child has and who is talking about it openly, who is proposing policies that will address that and who is who's sort of opening a door, as it were, on what can be a very hidden and secret life yes. and is blowing trumpets about it he's jumping off buildings he's riding on teacups he's taking all of the the um, ideas out of the fundraiser carers playbook and is deploying them to try and get this community of people to be seen and to be heard and i think for me there's been an element of joy in his campaign yes, that has. again is not entirely understood in the life of a carer because whilst it's incredibly grueling it's oh. hard it's frightening it's worrying it's all of those things it's poorly paid it's a juggle there's actually a huge lesson to be learned you know i've learned so much from caring for my child in a way that i never thought i would and that has often been to take the joy out of a situation you know in a yes. situation to find the fun you know, because things can be really difficult, you've got to snatch the laughs and the the silly moments and all of those things, and they're what keep you. That's what keeps you going as a carer. That's the. So you can't the, separate the two. For you, they are part and parcel of the same process, the same yeah. life, the they, same life. Yeah. They really, they really are. Oh. And I mean, all of the organisations that have supported my child and my family are doing fundraising by jumping off buildings, jumping out of planes, right. you know, cycling, wearing silly costumes, yes, of all course. of that stuff. Yes. It brings it brings a light to it and it brings a fun to it. You know, there's all of that stuff, you know, taking my child on the teacups. I mean, my, my child has issues leaving the house now, so that's that's not something we do. But, yeah. it, in, you know, one day, those are things that he would love and would make him laugh, you know, D doing all I those I hadn't thought things. of that. I hadn't thought of the link between the two elements of, of, of his life. But it, you, you describe it really beautifully, Alice. He's, it, he, I just think, you know, and I was saying to your, to your researcher, mm. David Cameron had a child with complex disabilities too, who yes, very tragically oh, passed yeah. away. And when he came to office, it, there was a lot, a lot of hope, I think, that he would also understand this group of people behind closed doors who were mm. doing what they were doing, this, this group of young people who were going to turn into adults who will need support for their whole life, um, that he would take the care system and the medical system and all of that system into something much more powerful and much more exciting. And unfortunately, that's not what happened. Brexit no. derailed whatever he might have done. And, and here we are now with a crumbling social care system oh. and a group of carers who are fighting every day for the most basic level of dignity and respect you and support. You feel seen for, for, for the first yeah. time, really, in the, in the, in the recent political cycles. Huge, hugely seen by him because he's in it. He understands it and he understands the joy in it as well. You know, he's not just emphasising the grind and the fight. He's emphasising what's wonderful and exciting and, and he's showing exactly what so many parent carers I know are like. 
you know, they're completely bonkers most of the yeah, time. Yeah, because you live in such a heightened reality. <laughs> I, uh, Matt says this lady talking about you, Alice, has an amazing point. This shows what happens when you understand somebody's background. So if it yeah. wasn't for John and John's illness, this campaign would not have scaled the silly heights that it has scaled because the silliness is is something beautiful, as you describe it. Indeed. And very special, and very special. Children with complex learning disabilities like John, like my son, they they thrive on silly and, you know, parents being ridiculous. And like I said, you have to snatch the fun out of these situations. I mean, he's probably going home and showing his boy the the footage of him jumping off things and falling off things, isn't he? And and, and reveling in the joy that his son derives from his, his dad's daftness. Precisely, and I oh. think it makes a larger political point as well. You've got me. You've destroyed well. me, Alice. I, I'll be quiet no. while you make the larger political I'm point. So sorry. No, it's, I thought you were a nervous <laughs> debutante. That disappeared fairly. That disappeared faster than Ed Davy falls off a off a paddleboard. Go on, give uh, me the. Any, bo- anyone who knows me will say I'll talk for England, so you'll never <laughs> get rid of me. But I, I think it makes a bigger political point about the extent that people in a caring role have to go to to make themselves seen. You know, Ed Davey could stand up next to Keir Starmer and Rishi Sunak with all the politics of negativity and accusation and retribution that they're throwing at one another. This really unpleasant, you know, Keir Starmer's yeah. not allowed to have dinner with his wife, mm. Rishi Sunak left either. It's so, it's so negative. But, and so Ed Davey could stand up there and throw accusations about how social care has been underfunded, how children's social workers have far too many cases and, yeah. you know, a desperate to support people and can't, how respite centres are closing all over the country. He could be standing there saying that, but he's chosen a different path. And I think it's a path that people should want for this country, that, <laughs> you know, do we need our politicians to just be closed and exhausted and angry? Or do we want them to be hopeful and joyful and to sometimes embrace being a bit silly? Much as I dislike Boris Johnson, there's a levity there that attracted people. No, you're right. It does attract people. Martin's written, Alice is so spot on with what she's saying. As a father carer myself, she's hit the nail on the head. Ed has opened a window into our world and showed a little of what we have to go through. Grab a little joy from a serious event. And I haven't got Claire's original message in front of me, Alice, but she sent me a subsequent one which says, oh, the call from Alice has completely changed my mind. I feel bad now, so I don't know what what she said before, (laughs) but I suspect it was something... people with disabilities, they often feel bad, and that should never be the case, because whilst, you know, my son may face so many challenges, he brings huge joy, and actually he's one of the happiest people I know. You know, he... (laughs) <laughs> his life is complex but when he's happy it's pure joy and I think that there's an element that Ed Davey has taken from his son that right. has seeped into his campaign and I, I feel very drawn to that you know it's not just the it's fact beautiful. that he lives a similar life to the no, one no, I live no, I think possibly silliness assumes a much higher value when you are steeped in seriousness all the yes. time doesn't it you can't do serious all the time. No, it can't. will make you crumble. And, and the more serious the quotidian is, the daily grind is, the more valuable the silliness becomes. Yeah, oh, you're brilliant. That is such and a... it's not entirely silly either. No, I know. It I know. supports your mental health. Yeah. It keeps you... And it keeps you a good carer. You know, it keeps you... It keeps things in perspective. You know, I, I like say to myself it. every day, this too shall pass. This too and shall as pass. As long as I can laugh. No, I, I hear it. And he's done done a lot of that. Final message from Nick from uh, uh, Joe, who says, I'm out delivering Lib Dem leaflets because of his conversation with his wife. I too have a child that is ser- severely dif- disabled. He is the only voice we have had yes. in the campaign. Alice, I, I, I'm, I'm going to struggle to follow that with your second call to the programme. You realise that, don't you? You've set the bar extraordinarily <laughs> I'll, high. I'll close on a high note then. <laughs> <laughs> you set the thank bar. You, though, no. and thank you for letting us have an opportunity to, hey. to put that out there. It's, no, it's, it's really important. And it's really we're important. Grateful. Thank you've you. brought a new light entirely to what I thought previously was, was a fairly knockabout conversation. But I, I, I get it now. I don't think that you could have that. Fro- fun, fun, a frolic, without the backdrop of of seriousness, Alice. I don't know that I've ever taken a call that articulates a relatively complicated idea as as clearly and as beautifully as you've just done. Thank you. It's twelve forty-five. 
12.47 is the time. Um, I, 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 I did wonder a moment ago how Ed Davey might end his campaign, what, what the climax of it might be. Um, Steve in Westminster is on the line. Skydiving, motorcycling, fast catamaran sailing. Oh, yeah. Well, that, I mean, there's certainly some suggestions there. Uh, I, I, anything else that, that you want to say? I don't wish to seem boastful, but people can see that my record is one of success. <laughs> Just to clarify, I wasn't asking earlier whether or not we should keep unhinged headline. I, I, that's going nowhere. Although I don't know what the Daily Telegraph comment pages are going to do uh, if if the polls are even close to correct and, and we have a Labour government by the end of the week. Um, that's going nowhere. The thing I was asking you about was was the game where I read out several headlines and pretend that one of them is false and then do the hilarious reveal at the end that they're both or that they're all actually true. So so today's was um, uh, the Brexit is a great success. Don't let Labour... Brexit has been a great success. Don't let Labour kill it, which is a genuine article by John Redwood. And then a genuine article in The Guardian. Rhys Mogg tells young Tories he wants to build a wall in the English Channel. And then you spend a couple of minutes trying to work out which one is true. And then I say, no, they're both true. Except you don't spend a couple of minutes trying to work out which one is true. Because every time I do this, they're all true. So I wasn't, I, 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 that's what I was asking. Does that silly game deserve to uh, sus be sustained? Or, or should we, in the words of the producer, try to be more sophisticated? I, will the headlines get more unhinged if Labour win the election or less unhinged? I, I honestly don't know. I do know that Henry Riley is here with an important story. Well, James, this is surrounding postal votes, and people can, you've probably seen anecdotally people suggesting they haven't received their postal ballots, there have been errors on the ones they've received, or that they've only just got their postal votes. We've been inundated with concerns um, ahead of Thursday's vote on that particular subject of postal votes, and there is a genuine fear that people could be disenfranchised as a result. Now, the Electoral Commission confirmed to us us that tens of thousands of postal votes were sent out only a matter of days ago at the weekend. The body which uh, oversees elections in the UK has blamed the holiday season for the issues. Now, the sheer rise in postal votes is quite extraordinary. 10 million people are planning to vote by post this time around. That's around 20 to 25 percent of the electorate. Mm. And we spoke with Peter Stanyan, who's the chief executive of the electoral administrators. They represent the people who you see work working in polling stations. And he warned that general election campaigns should actually be extended to cope with this new demand. Most people in the delivering of elections will argue for, ironically, is a longer time table. Uh, we're talking about, for a parliamentary election, 24 days for a returning officer to actually turn around a massive logistical exercise. As an association, we've been arguing for a 30-day timetable, which would marry, which, which would be the same as that that works for London mayoral election, for example, it would allow a degree of flexibility at the start of the process to get the votes into the system sooner, which then is to the benefit of both the voter and the returning officer. So and then Julie Jackson, James, is someone who applied for a postal ballot for her 20-year-old daughter, Katie, who is on holiday, knew she was going to be out of the country on Thursday, on polling day. And we spoke with Julie yesterday. We applied in good time. We had an email from our local council saying that the postal vote had been allowed come Friday, still hadn't received anything. So sent a chaser email to the local authority who said that the postal votes had been um, sent, but um, as I say, we hadn't received it. Um, in this morning's post, we received a what's called a postal poll card, which informed us that we should receive the postal vote by the 21st of June. So this poll card's obviously been sitting um, somewhere. Um, again, I sort of phoned the local authority and they confirmed once again that the postal vote had been sent out, but we still haven't received it. My daughter, she's gone on holiday today, so she's actually been denied the right to vote in what is her first general election, which I'm quite cross and sad about. And understandably, those people affected, voters, are very concerned. Also, rightly, politicians are somewhat concerned as well because they've been campaigning hard for the last few days. Someone you've been speaking about, we got reaction from Sir Ed Davey, who told us that he had concerns. Well, I'm really concerned just for our democracy, frankly. When people are you know, looking around for the swimming trunks and the sun cream to get the, the bags packed to, to get on holiday, the last thing they want to have to worry about is, you know, has the postal vote arrived? Um, and it is pretty serious, actually. 
So, James, just to recap. Was, so, he, was, he, was he wearing normal clothes? Was he dressed as a daffodil or what was he doing at the time? <laughs> he was, was in he... Scotland. So, I, yeah, he yeah. was actually, he was, this was a straight lace, said Davey. Yeah, okay. yeah, very, okay. very different. Um, now, James, just to recap, people who have applied for a postal ballot, you're not eligible to vote in person unless you physically have your ballot paper. So if, right. you, if you get a postal vote, if it arrives, if you don't want to send it off, that's fine. You can still go to the polling station, but of course you have to have the ballot. Um, you don't need your polling card just just to um, obviously tell you, you need your photo ID. And it's believed this issue could affect as many uh, as 91 constituencies up and down the UK. So clearly it is a, it is a huge issue. Many of those will be marginal seats um, as well. Also, if you do not receive your ballot paper, just sort of public service, if you don't receive your postal vote, you can still contact your local authority and request an emergency replacement postal vote up until 5pm on Thursday. So up until 5pm the day of the election and they should be able to um, to sort you out. And then lastly, James, Royal Mail in response because obviously mm. a lot of this has been levied against them. They say they have a specialist team that plan every aspect of the elections delivery programme. Where concerns have been raised, they're investigating and they've confirmed that all votes will be delivered as soon as they enter their network. Nicely done. Um, So we won't know until after polling day how many people have been denied their democratic right. Yeah, it will. It will only be on that Friday morning as we as we learn more. Yeah. Thank you, Henry. Uh, The time is approaching twelve fifty four. You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. A lot of love for Alice still coming in. Jan in Camden writes, "says What a great call!" As the mother of a special needs teacher who sees what parents like Alice and. Ed Davey go through daily and is involved in fighting the system alongside them. I can relate to what she has so eloquently conveyed. Alice has made herself the star of the show and Sir Ed the star of the election campaign. Um, I, I, yeah, I, and Tony makes a, 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 a different point, but an equally interesting one in Bishop Stortford. I'm a driver. I get all my news from the radio. So as such, I genuinely hadn't the foggiest who Ed Davey is. I never heard him speak at all until he started doing all the daft stuff. So maybe it's good. But that's the point I was making to, I think it was David, about he's not bidding to be prime minister. He's making a claim on our attention and it's worked. And And now that Alice has provided that extra perspective on how the levity is a necessary if you like, a, a, a necessary side effect of the seriousness with which his life is led in the context of his son's disabilities, it, it, it's become an altogether different proposition. It has for me, at least. Sarah is in Halston. Sarah, what would you like to say? I'd like to say that um, hearing a grown man squeal doing a bungee jump was just joyful and you'd have to have a heart of stone not to smile when you heard those sounds. Um, But when I saw him doing the um, Zumba class, (laughs) I did cringe. So you're picking apart the stunts now. So we're going we're going bungee good, Zumba bad. Yes. Okay. And I'm just thinking like a younger person because um, younger people, they have uh, their cringe factors um, settings are set very, very low. So they squirm at anything. Mm. Uh, So I think that's less attractive to younger voters. Um, But I also just wanted to make the point which um, um, references um, what Alice was saying about um, him being a carer. Yes. Um, Caring for someone does, it robs you of your, um, well, not robs you, but it, It cuts through. It takes away your pomposity. It takes away your ego. You have no vanity when you care for someone. And I do wonder about his his campaign team, which are very slick, very manipulative. And we saw that this morning, how, um, you know, Keir Starmer's... Mm. 
admission of having, you know, he was wanting to respect his Friday night dinner ritual with his Jewish wife, how yes. that was um, spun this morning by the Tory um, um, yeah, side. machine. Um, exactly. And I'm just wondering if Sir Ed Davey has perhaps been exploited by his own campaign team, you know, and they've... Well, you know, I don't... Probably, I mean... I, he's I, probably I, been very enthusiastic. But about all of thinking, it. Well, he's not... He's, yeah. a, he's not... I don't think he's, he, he would have done anything against his will. I don't think he's been frog marched into the, into the <laughs> no, upper no, but, water slide at gunpoint. But, right, jump! Jump! <laughs> like, and I don't think... No. I mean, we know, I know his people. They came in when he did full disclosure. There's no Malcolm Tuckers on... on uh, on Ed Davies' team, I, I think I think they've had a conversation and a calculation about what will cut through, what will show people what you're really like, and what will secure yeah. the most amounts of attention. And to to that end, it's it's worked beautifully. And I don't even know about the cringe thing. I think because he's done so much, yeah. that there's there's not much room for cringe. If he'd only done one or two things, and one was a bit cringe and one wasn't, then he's got fifty percent cringe. But when you combine them all together, it's a kind of cringe-free context because it is all so silly. It's also dark. Yep. I, it yeah. works for me, but but I take your point. There've been moments, certainly the the Zumba. I don't know if he was d- taking it as seriously as he should have done. Actually, Sarah, that may be why he looked so so. <laughs> well, so I flippant. don't think it, I, I don't think will have turned into boats. And um, no. and, well, and we'll, uh, Alice mentioned, um, you know, David Cameron had a child, a yes. six year old son, who passed away. But also, um, where, um, also. Um, Oh my God, Don't Labour worry. gentleman, not um, the opposition, um, <laughs> not Cameron. Oh my Tony, goodness, Tony, Labour guy, T- Tony not Blair. A very serious, T- prudent, financial prudent. It's Gordon he Brown, Gordon daughter. Brown's son, John. Gordon Brown had yeah. a baby daughter who died. Oh yes, and they right. were very much more statesmanlike. Didn't capitalise on their. Well, they're in different roles, of course. They are, but I take I take your point. I, I, I take, I, although he hasn't done anything unstatesmanlike with regard to his son, they, they've been separate instances. And, and what Alice did, I thought, was knit them together in a, in a very compelling and, and, and very moving fashion. But, yeah, I, I, I mean, you're right about some of that, definitely. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, that's it from me for today. Sarah knocked us back, of course, to the conversation about Keir Starmer's dinner. Um, I, I just want to add one final postscript to that with a story from 2017 by someone called Natasha Clark. I don't know what happened to her. But um, but here's a story from 2017 under the headline, May's Me Time, Saturday morning gym trip and church at home on Sundays, the two unmovable events in Theresa May's diary. And Natasha wrote in 2017, Theresa May's diary is packed to the brim, but there are two events the PM simply won't move, her former head of communications has revealed. An early gym trip on Saturday and morning communion at church on Sunday are in the words of Theresa May's former director of communications, Katie Perrier, they were unmovables. Precisely no Conservative MPs complained about this uh, and not a single news outlet pretended that it cast any doubts whatsoever upon her fitness to be Prime Minister. Funny that. That's it from me for today. We'll be back again tomorrow morning at 10. If you've missed any of today's show, you can listen back on Catch Up on Global Player, the official LBC app, where you can also pause and rewind live radio. Uh, Download it now for free from your app store or head to globalplayer.com. Coming up at four on LBC, it's Tom Swarbrick. But now you may have heard her bellowing in the background during that last... (laughs) I just knew that I knew who she was referring to and I couldn't contain myself. You don't mind, do you, James? I I love it. Don't mind, do you, James? I I love it. Don't mind, do you, James? I love it. Don't mind, DJ. 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 I love it. Don't mind, DJ.